Fables 139 and 140 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry, and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 139, An Animal in the Moon. Some sages argue that all men are dupes, and that their senses lead the fools in troops. Other philosophers reverse this quite, and prove that man is nearly always right. Philosophy says true, senses mislead, if we judge only by them without heed. But if we mark the distance and reflect on atmosphere and what it will effect, the senses cheat none of us nature's wise. I'll give you an instance with my naked eyes. I see the sun, how large is it, think you? Three feet at farthest? It appears so true. But could I see it from a nearer sky, t'would seem of our vast universe the eye. The distance shows its magnitude, you see. My hand discovers angles easily. Fools think the earth is flat, it's round, I know. Some think it motionless, it moves so slow. Thus, in a word, my eyes have wisdom got. The illusions of the senses cheat me not. My soul beneath appearances sees deep. My eyes too quick, a watch on it I keep. My ear not slow to carry sounds betrays, when water seems to bend a stick ten ways. My reason helps me out, and if my sight lies always, yet it never cheats me quite. If I would trust my senses very soon, they'd tell me of the woman in the moon. What is there really? No mistrust your eyes, for what you see are inequalities. The surface of the moon has many regions. Here spread the plains, there mountains rise in legions. In light and shade strange figures you can trace, an elephant, an ox, a human face. Not long ago in England men perplexed, saw in a telescope what savants vexed. A monster in this planet's mirror fair, while cries of horror filled the midnight air. Some change was pending, some mysterious change, predicting wars or a misfortune strange the monarch came he favored learned men the wondrous monster showed itself again it was a mouse between the glasses shut the source of war the nibbler of a nut the people laughed o oh, nation blessed with ease when will the french have time for toils like these mars brings us glories harvests still the foe shrinks down before us dreading every blow tis we who seek them sure that victory slave to our louis follows ceaselessly his flag his laurels render us renowned yet memory has not left this mortal round we wish for peace for peace alone we sigh charles tastes the joys of rest he would in war display his valor and his flag bear far to reach the tranquil joy that now he shares, would he could end our quarrels and our cares. What incense would be his, what endless fame, did not Augustus win a glorious name? Equal to Caesar's in its majesty, and worthy of like reverence, may be. O oh, happy people, when will peace come down, to dower our nation with her olive crown? End of Fable 139 Fable 140 the fortune teller opinion is the child of chance and this opinion forms our taste against all people i advance these words i find the world all haste infatuation justice gone a torrent towards a goal unseen we only know things will be dawn in their own way as they have been in paris lived a sorceress who told the people of their fate all sought her men girls loverless a husband whom his wife thought late in dying many a jealous woman ill-natured mothers by the score came for they were all simply human to hear what fortune had in store her tricks of trade were hardihood some terms of art a neat address sometimes a prophecy proved good and then they thought her nothing less than delphi's pythoness of yore though ignorance itself was she and made her wretched garret floor highway for gullibility grown rich she took a house and bought a place of profit for her lord 
the witch's garret soon was sought by a young girl who never soared to witchery save by eyes and voice but yet they all came as of old the lucky who in wealth rejoice and poor to have their fortunes told the regulation had been made for this poor place by her who late had been its tenant and the shade sibyllic hovered o'er its state in vain the maiden said you mock read fate i scarcely know my letters but though such words of course might shock they never could convince her betters predict divine here's gold in pay more than the learned get together what wonder if the maid give way despite herself such gold to gather for fortune-telling seemed the place all tumble down and weird and broken a broomstick for the witch's chase and many another mystic token the witch's sabbath all suggested the change of body and of face and so in fate fools still invested but what of her who made the place she seeks the golden prize to gain in gorgeous state like any parrot but people jeer and pass in vain they all go rushing to the garret tis custom governs everything i've often seen in courts of law some stupid barrister who'll bring briefs such as clever men ne'er saw all a mistake his eyes may glisten they'll take him for some other man one unto whom the world will listen explain me this now if you can end of fable one hundred and forty this recording is in the public domain. Fables 141 and 142 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 141, The Cobbler and the Banker A cobbler who would sing from dawn to dark, A very merry soul to hear and see, as satisfied as all the seven wise men could be had for a neighbor not a paltry clerk but a great banker who could roll in gold a croesus singing little sleeping less who if by chance he had the happiness just towards morning to drop off i'm told was by the cobbler's merry singing woke loud he complained that heaven did not keep for sale in market-places soothing sleep he sent then for the cobbler twas no joke what gregory do you earn in the half year half year sir said the cobbler very gaily i do not reckon so i struggle daily for the day's bread and only hunger fear well what a day what is your profit man now more now less the worst thing is those fates why without them and hang their constant dates the living would be tidy drat the plan monsieur the cure always a fresh saint stuffs in his sermon every other week the banker laughed to hear the fellow speak and utter with such naivete his complaint i wish he said to mount you on a throne here are a hundred crowns knave keep them all they'll serve you well whatever ill befall the cobbler thought he saw before him thrown all money in the earth that had been found home went he to conceal it in a vault safe from discovery and thieves assault there too he buried joy deep underground no singing now he'd lost his voice from fear his guests were cares suspicions vain alarms all day he watched at night still dreading harms if but a cat stirred robbers he could hear at last the poor fool to his neighbor ran he had not woke him lately i'm afraid return my songs and tranquil sleep he said and take your hundred crowns my generous man end of fable one forty one fable one forty two the cat the weasel and the little rabbit a little rabbit's charming nook a weasel seized upon one morn his household gods with him he took jane rabbit's mansion to adorn at break of day departed jane to munch amongst the thyme and roses returning at her window pane why there the wicked weasel's noses o oh, gracious goodness what is here turned out of my paternal hall from this you quickly disappear or i'll give all the rats a call 
The weasel simply said the earth always belonged to the first comer. All other claims were little worth. A sufferance tenant, a misnomer. A little kingdom he had found. Now tell me, what more right have you to these domains, this patch of ground, than Tom or Dick, than Nan or Sue? Usage and custom of the law, the rabbit said, give me the place. On sires and grandsires' claims I stand, I who here represent their race. A law most wise can't be more wise, said cunning weasel, what of that? Our claims to settle I devise, a reference to our friend the cat. It was a cat of solemn mien, a very hermit of a cat, a saint upon whose face was seen, precept and practice, law and fat. The rabbit here agreed, and then they sought the pious pussy's home. Approach, I'm deaf, he said, and when they came, they told him why they'd come. Approach, fear not, for calm is law, for law no one here ever lacks, and stretching on each side a claw, he broke both litigants' weak backs. This story calls unto my mind the sad result which often springs from squabbles of a larger kind, which small grand dukes refer to kings. End of Fable 142 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 143 and 144 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Fable 143 The Lion, the Wolf, and the Fox A lion, sickly, weak, and full of years, desired a remedy against old age. Impossibles, a word no monarch hears without directly flying in a rage. He sent for doctors, men of draughts and pills, from far and near, obedient to the call, came makers up of recipes and pills. The fox alone declined to come at all. At court the wolf malignantly referred to Reynard's absence, whereupon the king, whose anger was aroused at what he had heard, decided on a rather cruel thing. He sent a force to smoke sly Reynard out and bring him willy-nilly. When he came, the fox could scarcely entertain a doubt as to whose tongue had put him thus to shame. I greatly fear, your majesty, said he, you think me rude, you wrong me if you do. For I was on a pilgrimage, you see, and went to offer up my vows for you. I scarcely need inform you, I have met expert physicians whilst I was away, and hope to cure you of your sickness yet which comes from a coldness of the blood, they say. You must, sire, skin a wolf, and wrap the skin about you close, to get the body warmed. And when the heat has kindled up within, the fires of life again, the cure is performed. Our friend, I'm sure, will take immense delight in lending you his coat. So take it, sire. The lion supped upon the wolf that night, and made the skin a part of his attire. Courtiers, discretion is your safest plan. Malice is sure to find its source again. And while you do yourself what good you can, reflect that slandering others is in vain. Fable 144 The Head and the Tail of the Serpent The snake has two parts, it is said, hostile to man, his tail, and head. And both, as all of us must know, are well known to the fates below. Once on a time a feud arose, for the precedence almost blows. I always walked before the tail, so said the head, without a veil. The tail replied, I travel o'er furlongs and leagues, I, score on score, just as I please. Then is it right I should be always in this plight? Jove, I am sister and not slave. Equality is all I crave. Both of the selfsame blood I claim our treatment then should be the same. As well as her I poison bear, powerful and prompt, for men to fear, and this is all I wish to ask. Command it, 
tis a simple task let me but in my turn go first for her twill be no whit the worst i sure can guide as well as she no subject for complaint shall be heaven was cruel in consenting such favors lead but to repenting jove should be deaf to such wild prayers he was not then so first she fares she who in brightest days saw not no more than shut up in a pot struck against rocks in many a tree gainst passers-by continually until she led them both you see straight into sticks unhappy all those wretched states who like her fall End of Fable 144. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 145 and 146 by John de la Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Fable 145 The Dog Which Carried Round His Neck His Master's Dinner. Few eyes are against beauty proof, few hands from gold can keep aloof, few people guard a treasure well, or of strict faithfulness can tell. A certain dog, true, brave, and stout, carried his master's dinner out. This self-denial pressed him hard, when he had dainty food to guard. Yet long he kept it safe and sound. Well, we are tempted oft, tis found, by good things near us. Strange we learn from dogs, and yet we hopeless turn from men when temperance is in view. One day this dog, so staunch and true, a mastiff met, who wished to seize the dinner. Not so, if you please. The dog put down the food to fight a mighty combat. Left and right came other dogs, mere thieves and foes, who cared not for the hardest blows our dog who dreaded every stranger and saw the food was much in danger wanted his share come gentlemen this rabbit does for me now then you take the rest so he leapt on it and then the others fell upon it he snapped the best and then they flew and shared the plunder the whole crew and so sometimes when they yield a town and soldiers burghers trample down sheriffs and provosts are the worst to rob and pillage being first pleasant to see them pistols seize filling their purses at their ease and if by chance to one more cool some scruples come they call him fool then he repents him of the blunder and is the first to lead the plunder Fable 146 Death and the Dying Man Death never yet surprised the sage who's always ready for the stage, knowing each hour that comes may be his passage to eternity. Death's rule embraces every day, each moment is beneath his sway. We all pay tribute to that lord, we all bow down beneath his sword. The instant the king's child has birth, and looks forth on this desert earth that instant death may it surprise and close its scarcely opened eyes beauty youth virtue every day death steals so ruthlessly away one day the world will be his prey this knowledge is most largely shared for no event we're less prepared a dying man a century old complained to death that he was told too suddenly before his will was made he'd duties to fulfill now is it just this was his cry to call me unprepared to die no wait a moment pray sir do my wife would wish to join me too for still one nephew i'd provide and i still have causes to decide i must enlarge my house you know don't be so pressing pray sir go old man said death for once be wise my visit can be no surprise what i impatient in the throng of paris who has lived so long find me in all france even ten i should have warned you you say then 
And so your will you would have made, Your grandson settled, basement laid. What, not a warning when your feet can scarcely move, And fast retreat your memory makes, When half your mind and wit is left a league behind? When nearly all fails, no more hearing, no taste, All fading as I'm fearing. The star of day shines now in vain for you. Why sigh to view again the pleasures out of reach? Just see your comrades drop continually, dead, dying. Is no warning there? I put it to you, is this fair? Come, come, old man. What, wrangling still? No matter, you must leave your will. The great republic cares not, sir, for no one or no executor. And death was right. Old men, at least, should die as people leave a feast. Thanking the host, their luggage trim, death will not stay to please their whim. You murmur, dotard, look and sigh, to see the young that daily die. Walk to the grave or run, a name to win of everlasting fame. Death glorious may be, yet how sure and sometimes cruel to endure. In vain I preach with foolish zeal, those most akin to death but feel the more regret in quitting life, and creep reluctant from the strife. End of Fable 146 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 147 and 148 by John de la Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Fable 147 The Power of Fables To Monsieur de Barillon How can a great ambassador descend to simple tales a patient ear to lend? How could I trifling verses to you bring, or dare with transient playfulness to sing? Or if, sometimes, I vainly tried to soar, Would you not only deem me rash once more? You have more weighty matters to debate Than of a weasel and a rabbit's fate. Read me, or read me not, but, oh, debar All Europe banding against us in war. Lest from a thousand places there arise Fresh enemies our legions to surprise. England already wearies of her rest, and views our king's alliance as a jest. Is it not time that Louis sought repose? What Hercules but weary of his blows at the huge Hydra? Will it show its might and press again the lately ended fight by thrusting forth another head to meet at his strong sinewy arm a fresh defeat? If your mind, pliant, eloquent, and strong, could soften hearts but avert this wrong, I'd sacrifice a hundred sheep to you, a pretty thing for a poor bard to do. Have then at least the kindness graciously this pinch of incense to receive from me. Accept my ardent vows and what I write. The subject suits you that I here indite. I'll not repeat the praises envy owns are due to you, who need not fear her groans. In Athens' city, fickle, vain, of old, an orator who dangers manifold saw crowding in his country, one day went up in the tribune, with the wise intent, with his skilled tongue, and his despotic art, towards a republic to force every heart. He spoke with fervor about the common weal. They would not listen, they were hard as steel. The orator, to rouse them, had recourse to metaphors of greater fire and forced to sting the basest he awoke the dead he zeus-like flamed and thundered o'er each head the wind bore all away yes every word the many-headed monster had not heard they ran to see the rabble children play or two boys fighting made them turn away what did the speaker do he tried once more Sarah's, he said once made we hear a tour an eel and swallow followed her a river gave them some demure the eel it swam the swallow flew now what i tell you's really true and as he uttered this the crowd and sarah's what did she cried loud 
just what she did then pious rage stirred him to execrate the age what children's tales absorb your mind careless of all the woes behind thou only careless grecian state what philip does you should debate at this reproach the mob grew still and listened with a better will such silence a mere fable won we're like the greeks all said and done and i myself who preach so well if any one to me would tell the pure dan i should with delight listen for half the livelong night the world is old as i have heard and i believe it on my word yet still though old i'm reconciled to entertain it like a child fable one hundred forty eight the bear and the amateur of gardening a certain mountain bruin once they say was wont within a lonely wood to stray a new bellerophon secluded there his mind had gone and left his brain pan bare reason on lonely people sheds no ray it's good to speak better to silent stay both in excess are bad no animal was ever seen or was within a call bare though he was he wearied of this life and longed for the world's joy and the world's strife then melancholy marked him for her own not far from him an old man lived alone dull as the bear he loved his garden well was a priest of flora and pomona still though the employment's pleasant a kind friend is needful its full charms to it to lend gardens talk little save in my small book weary at last of their mere smiling look and those his dumb companions one fine day our man set forth upon his lonely way to seek a friend the bear with the same thought had left his mountain satisfied with naught by chance most strange the two adventurers meet at the same turning he's afraid to greet the bear but fly he can't what can he do well like a gascon he gets neatly through conceals his fright the bear is not well bred still growls come see me but the other said here is my cottage pray come in my lord do me the honour at my frugal board to lunch al fresco i have milk and fruit that will perhaps your worship's pleasure suit for once though not your ordinary fare i offer all i have with friendly air their chums already before reaching home still better friends when there they've fairly come in my opinion it's a golden rule better be lonely than be with a fool the bear who did not speak two words a day left the drudge there to work and toil away bruin went hunting and brought in the game or flapped the blowflies when the blowflies came and kept them off his sleeping partner's face of winged parasites the teasing race one day a buzzer o'er the sleeping man poised and then settled on his nose their plan the bear was crazy all his chase was vain i'll catch you thief he cried it came again twas said twas done the flapper seized a stone and launched it bravely bravely it was thrown he crushed the fly but smashed the poor man's skull a sturdy thrower but a reasoner dull nothing so dangerous as a foolish friend worse than a real wise foe you may depend end of fable 148 this recording is in the public domain fables 149 and 150 by jean de la fontaine Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 149. The Man and the Flea. People pray to and weary the gods now and then, about trifles unworthy to interest men, thinking providence cruel unless it contrives to design to their likings the whole of their lives. Why believe that Olympus should study us more than it studied the Greeks and the Trojans of yore? 
A gabby was bit on the shoulder one night by a flea which took refuge instanter in flight. Oh, Hercules, Hercules, prithee come down and exterminate fleas, cried the suppliant clown. Oh, Jupiter, strike with your lightning the beasts and avenge me on them and their horrible feasts. To punish a flea, twould be rather a wonder if gods went to work with their clubs and their thunder. End of Fable 149 Fable 150 The Woman and the Secret A secret is a dreadful weighty thing. Few women carry secrets very far. And this remark doth to my memory bring some men too born beneath the female star. To try his wife, a husband one night cried, Ye gods, I perish, spare me, spare, I pray. For lo, I have just laid an egg. An egg, she sighed? Here it is, newly laid, but do not say a single word, or they will call me hen. Be silent, darling. Then in full belief, she swore by all the gods to keep all men quite in the dark, so she assured her chief. But with the shadows passed those words of hers, foolish and indiscreet, at earliest dawn. She seeks her neighbor, and she thus avers, My gossip, such a thing took place last night. You must say nothing, or I shall be beat. My husband laid an egg, yes, large and white, and big as any four, but don't repeat, in heaven's name, nor mention anywhere, this strange occurrence. Now I see you mock, the other said, what mention the affair you know me not go i am like a rock the hen's wife hastened homeward presently the other spreads the tail in twenty places the one big egg she quickly turns to three nor was this all to many startled faces another chatterer makes the number four whispering is no more needful all is known before the day was over there had flown a rumor that the man had forty score of chickens of his own all cackling round his door. End of Fable 150 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 151 and 152 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 151, Tursus and Amaranth, from Mademoiselle de Sillery. I quitted Aesop long ago for pleasant old Boccaccio, but now a fair divinity would once more from Parnassus see fables in my poor manner so to answer with a boorish no without a valid stout excuse to goddesses would be no use divinities need more than this and bells especially i wis her wishes are all queens you see she rules us all does sillery who wishes once again to know of master wolf and master crow who can refuse her majesty none can deny her how can i well, to her mind my stories are obscure and too mysterious far, for sometimes even beaux esprits are puzzled and astray, you see. Let us then write in plainer tune that she may so decipher soon. I'll sing of simple shepherds then, before I rhyme of wolves again. Tursus to youthful amaranth one day said, Ah, but if you knew the griefs that slay, pleasing enchantments have enkindled woe, the greatest joy of earth you then would know oh let me picture them you need not fear could i deceive you stay then sweet and hear what i betray i whose poor heart is cleft by fondest hopes that cruel love has left then amaranth exclaimed what is this pain how call you it now tell me once again tis love a pretty word its symptoms tell how shall i know it i who am so well a malady to which all pleasant things yes even all the pleasures of great kings seem poor and faded lovers thus are known in gloomy forests they will walk alone muse by the river watch the stream beside yet their own faces rise not from the tide one image only in the flood shows day by day this lovely shadow comes but to betray 
to other things they're blind a shepherd speaks his voice his name raise blushes on your cheeks you like to think of him yet know not why you wonder at the wish and yet you sigh you fear to see him yet absent cry amaranth leaped for joy is this then love is that the pain you rank all things above it is not new to me i think i know it tursus thought he was safe but dared not show it the maid said yes and that i freely grant is what i fear for dear clitamant then tursus almost burst with rage and spite but yet it served the cheating fellow right thinking to gain the prize he lost the game and only cleared the road for him who came end of fable one fifty one fable one fifty two the joker and the fishes he's vastly popular your funny man for my part i avoid him when i can i generally find him rather hollow the joker's is no easy art to follow i think sarcastic people were created for fools to grin at when exhilarated let me present one at a dinner table to point a moral and adorn a fable a wag dining out at a banker's one day had some very small fishes put near him he saw there were finer ones farther away so pretending the fishes could hear him he muttered some words to the poor little creatures and feigned to receive their replies it was done with such grave and unchangeable features that people all opened their eyes then he said that some particular friend was en route for the indies or thereabouts and he feared he might come to a watery end so he wanted some hints of his whereabouts the fishes had answered he added politely that they were too young to reply but they fancied their fathers could answer him rightly should one of them chance to be by to say that the company relished the jest or the jester is more than i'm able but it answered his end for they gave him the best of the fishes that lay on the table twas a monster that might have related him stories as much as a century old long tales of the sea of its perils and glories as wondrous as ever were told end of fable one fifty two this recording is in the public domain Fables 153 and 154 by Jean de la Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 153, The Rat and the Oyster A rustic rat of mighty little sense, weary of home, would needs go travel thence, and quitted the paternal hearth one day to study life in places far away at each wide prospect hitherto unscanned he murmured oh how beautiful how grand yon mount is caucasus begirt with pines that range methinks must be the apennines for every molehill to his wondering eyes became a mountain of terrific size he reached a province of the land at last where tethys deity of the seas had cast some oysters on the sand which looked at least like first-rate frigates to our simple beast my father is a timid soul he said who fears to travel what an empty dread as to myself what marvels i have seen what scores of wonders earthly and marine thus boasted he in magisterial tone and boasted loud though speaking all alone most rats i beg to say are more discreet and use their lips but when they wish to eat meanwhile one oyster a luxurious one with shells apart was basking in the sun tasting the balmy breeze it lay agape a fine fat morsel of seductive shape the rat with moistenings of the under lip mistaking still the oyster for a ship ran up and smelling something nice to eat prepared straightway his grinders for a treat the crew quoth he have left a feast on board a cold collation fit for any lord if it deceive me not i've got a prize or else i do not know the use of eyes so saying master rat resolving well peered round the pearly margin of the shell it held him fast the oyster from his nap had woke and sharply shut his treacherous trap this all arose from fatal ignorance 
the fables useful to the folks of france nor france alone it shows with what surprise the simplest object strikes a booby's eyes and notice oftentimes for want of wit the fool who thinks he's biting his first bit end of fable 153 fable 154 the two friends two steadfast friends lived once in monomtapa they lived as if really they'd had the same papa what one earned the other earned ah for that land it's worth ten such countries as ours understand one night when a deep sleep had fallen on all and the sun had gone off in the dark beyond call one of these worthy men woke by a nightmare ran to his friend in a shiver and quite bare the other at once takes his purse and his sword accosts his companion and says pon my ward you seldom are up when all the other men snore you make better use of the night than to pore over books but come tell me you're ruined at play or you have quarrelled with some one now speak out i say here's my sword and my purse or if eager to rest on a fond wife's compassionate fondling breast take the slave she is fair no no said the other twas neither of these things that startled me brother thanks thanks for your zeal twas a dream that i had i saw you appear to me looking so sad i feared you were ill and ran to you to see twas that dream so detestable brought me to thee which friend loved the most come reader speak out the question is hard and leaves matter for doubt a true friend is choicest of treasures indeed in the depths of your heart he will see what you need he'll spare you the pain to disclose woes yourself and different to either his trouble or pelf a dream when he loves or a trifle mere air will strike him with terror lest danger be there End of Fable 154. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 155 and 156 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Fable 155 The Pig, the Goat, and the Sheep. A goat, a sheep, and a fat pig were sent to market, to their mutual discontent, not for the pleasures of the noisy fair, but just to sell, the farmer's only care. Not to see juggler's tricks drove on the carter, bent only on his traffic and his barter. Sir Porker screeched, as if he felt the knife, or heard ten butchers plotting against his life. It was a noise to deafen any one his mild companions prayed him to have done the carter shouts good heavens why this riot you'll drive us silly fool can't you be quiet these honest folks should teach you manners man so hold your tongue you coward if you can observe this sheep he has not said a word and he is wise now fool you talk absurd if he the dangers knew as well as i till he was hoarse and blind he'd bleed and cry and this my other friend so calm and still would scream his life out as i carter will they think you're only going on the morrow from this his milk from that his wool to borrow they may be right or wrong i do not know but i am certain of the deadly blow i'm good but for the spit farewell to you my house and wife and children now adieu sir porker reasoned with sufficient skill but all was useless he was fit to kill fear nor complaint could change his destiny he who looks forward least will wisest be fable one hundred and fifty six the rat and the elephant in france there's many a man of small degree fond of asserting his own mightiness a nobody turns somebody we see in this the nation's natural flightiness in spain men are not vain their high-flown schools have made them proud yet have not made them fools a tiny rat saw a huge elephant travelling slowly with his equipage mongst beasts a sultan knowing not a want his suite comprised within the monstrous cage 
his household gods his favorite dog and cat his paroquet his monkey and all that the rat astonished to see people stare at so much bulk and state which took up all the space where he of right should have his share upon the citizens began to call fools know you not that smallest rats are equal to biggest elephants alas the sequel is it his monstrous bulk you're staring at it can but frighten little girls and boys why i can do the same you see a rat is scarce less than an elephant a noise the cat sprang from her cage and with one pant the rat found he was not an elephant End of Fable 156. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 157 and 158 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Funeral or the Lioness The lion lost his wife one day and everybody made his way to bring the prince that consolation which makes us feel our desolation the king announced the funeral on such a day to one and all they regulate the obsequy and marshal the vast company as you may guess each one was there the prince's groanings filled the air and the den shook above below lions have got great lungs you know as the king does all the others do so the best courtiers blubbered too let me define a court a place sad gay where every changeful face careless of joy is ready still to change again at the king's will and if some cannot change they try to watch the change in the king's eye chameleons apes in every feature plastic and pliant in their nature one soul by turns fills many bodies these knaves are soulless which more odd is but to return the stag alone uttered no single sigh or groan it could not well be otherwise this death avenged old injuries the queen had cruel mischief done strangled his wife and slain his son therefore he shed no single tear a flatterer noticed hovering near moreover the spy saw him smile the anger of a king meanwhile i may observe with solomon the wisest man beneath the sun is terrible but to our friend no book could much instruction lend base creature of the woods with scorn the lion cried you do not mourn what should prevent our sacred claws teaching you friendship's holy laws come wolves avenge that queen of mine offer this victim on her shrine the stag replied the time for grief is past tears are now useless chief your wife whose features well i know appeared to me an hour ago half hid in flowers my friend she said for me your tears are vainly shed weep not in the elysian fields i've every pleasure that life yields conversing with my holy friends but for a time the king descends to a despair that charms me so scarce had he spoken thus when lo a miracle the courtiers cry the stags rewarded instantly and safely without punishment back to his native woods is sent with dreams amuse a listening king with falsehood sweet and flattering whatever rage within may burn he'll gorge the bait and friendly turn the basha and the merchant an old greek merchant one day sought protection from a basha bought at pasha's not at merchant's price such guardians are not very nice it cost so much that he complained his purse and coffer were both drained three other turks of lower station offered from sheer commiseration their joint help by word and deed 
for less than half the first to seed. The Greek he listens, then agrees. The Basha, cheated of his fees, is told that if of time the nick he'd seize, these rascals he must trick. Send them to Mohammed to bear a message for his private ear, and quickly too, or they united, knowing his friends, would see him righted, would send him some vile poison broth to show the keenness of their wrath, and that would send him to protect the Stygian merchants, they expect. The Turk, an Alexander, strode unto the merchant's snug abode, down at the table sat, his air generous, bold, and free from care, for he feared nothing. How could he? My friend, he said, you're quitting me, and people tell me to watch keenly. You are too worthy, so serenely, no poisoner ever looks, I know, so no more on that tack will go. But for these patrons you have found, hear me, to tell a tale I'm bound. To wrong you I have no intent, with reasoning or with argument. Once a poor shepherd used to keep a dog to guard his silly sheep, till someone asked him, plain and pat, how could he keep a beast like that? With such a ravenous appetite, it really wasn't fair or right. Twas there on every one's desire he'd give the dog up to the squire. Three terriers were best for him, to guard his flocks in life and limb, the cur ate three times more than they. But the fool meddlers did not say he also fought with treble teeth when wolves came howling out for death. The shepherd listened, three dogs bought, they cost him less, but never fought. The flock discovered their ill lot almost as soon as you, I wot. Your wretched choice will quickly do, now mark what I have said to you. If you'll do well, return to me. The Greek obeyed him speedily. Tis good the provinces should heed. Tis better, in good faith I plead, unto one powerful king to bend than on poor princelings to depend. End of Fable 158「Fables 159 and 160 by Jean de la Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Fable 159 The Horoscope A man will sometimes meet his destiny. The moment that he turns ill luck to flee. A father had an only son, and dear he held him, so his love is kin to fear. He with astrologers held a debate about the stars that ruled the infant's fate. One of these people said the father's care should of all lions specially beware. Till he was twenty he should keep him in, and, after that, his safety would begin. The cautious father, resolute to save his offspring from the ever-yawning grave, knowing the danger, turned on one neglect, guarded him carefully in this respect, forbade him exit, barred up every door, but other pleasures lavished more and more. With his companions, all the live-long day, he was allowed to walk and run and play. When he had reached the age that loves the chase, a closer ward they kept upon the place. They talked with scorn of all the huntsman's joys, spoke of the dangers, mocked the trumpet's noise. But all in vain were sermons, though well meant. Nothing can change the force of temperament. The youth was restless, fiery, hot and brave. The stormy impulses came, wave on wave. He sighed for pleasure, more the obstacle, the more desire, in vain they try to quell. He knew the cause of all his misery. The spacious house, so rich with luxury, was full of pictures and of tapestry, the subjects hunting scenes in forest glades, here animals, there men, strong lights, dark shades. The weaver made the lion chief of all. Out, monster, cried the youth and eyed the wall with foaming rage. Tis you that keep me here in gloom and fetters. Is it you I fear? 
He spoke, and struck with all a madman's might, the beast so innocent. There, out of sight under the hanging, a sharp nail was stuck. It pricked him deeply, by the worst of luck. The arts of Esculapius were in vain. He joined the shadows that owned Pluto's reign. His death was due to his fond sire's regard that in the locked-up palace kept him barred. It was precaution, too, that Wylam slew the poet, Aeschylus, if they say true. It had been prophesied a house should fall upon his head, so he shunned tower and wall, the city left, and camped out on the plain. Far from all roofs and danger he was slain. An eagle, with a tortoise in his grip, flew by. The poet's bald head from the upper sky looked like a smooth bowler the bird let drop the prey he wished to crush upon the top. So perished Aeschylus from hence we see. The art, if true, led to the misery that they would shun all who in it had trust. But I maintain it's false and quite unjust. I'll ne'er believe that nature ties our hands or would submit herself to such vile bands as in the skies to write our future fate. Times, persons, places have far greater weight than the conjunctions of a charlatan under the self-same planet tell the men. Are kings and shepherds born, though one may sway with golden scepter and the other play with ashen crook the will of Jupiter? A star has not a soul, my worthy sir. Why should its influence affect these two so diversely? How can it pierce through that sea of air, those cloudy gulfs profound, Mars and the sun, and pass each fiery bound? An atom would disturb it on its path. Horoscope mongers, let me rouse your wrath. The state of Europe, who predicted that? Did you foresee it? Now, then answer pat. Think of each planet's distance and its speed. These sages' passions, it is well agreed, prevent their judging of our actions right. On them our fate depends. A planet's course goes, like our minds, with a still varying force. And yet these fools, with compass and with line, of men's whole lives, would map out a design. But do not let the tales that I repeat weigh in the balance more than it is meet. The fate of boy in Aeschylus came true, blind and deceitful though the art be too. Once in a thousand times the bull's eyes hit. That is the good luck of your juggling wit. Fable 160 The Torrent and the River With a roar and a dreadful sound, the torrent dashed down the rock. All fled from its mighty bound, in horror followed the shock, shaking the fields around. No traveler dared essay to cross the torrent save one, who, meeting thieves by the way, and finding all chances gone, rode straight through the foam and spray. No depth, all menace and din. The traveler drew his breath with courage and laughed within himself at escape from death but the thieves resolve to win. His path they pursue and keep till he comes to a river clear. Peaceful and tranquil is sleep and as far removed from fear its banks are in no way steep. But pure and glistening sand border the placid wave. He leaves the dangerous land to find a treacherous grave. It was deep, you'll understand. He drinks of the awful sticks for deepest waters are still. Beware of quiet men's tricks. But for noisy men, they will battle with words, not sticks. End of Fable 160. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 161 and 162 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 161, The Ass and the Dog We ought to help each other, wise men say. An ass forgot this motto one fine day. I know not how our beast ignored the rule, for he's an amiable, good-natured fool. 
a trusty dog so gravely paced along the master took his nap at even song the ass began to roam about and feed and found at last a rank and savoury mead there were no thistles that he must endure one must not be too much an epicure the feast was still not bad while aught remains twould pass for once the air's fresh on these plains the dog half dead with hunger said at last my dear companion all this time i fast stoop down a bit and let the panniers fall i'll take my dinner out no word at all the ass vouchsafed fearing to lose a bite at length he deigned to answer the poor wight friend when your master rouses from his nap he's sure at once to call you on his lap and give you a good meal a wolf just then ran forth half famished from his forest den the ass called loudly to the dog to aid the dog stood still my friend he quickly said fly till your master wakes he'll not be long run fast if caught avert the coming wrong with a hard kick and break the wretch's jaw they've shot you lately and you're right in law mine stretch him flat the dog spoke wise and well but the wolf choked the ass and down he fell conclusion we should always help each other and every man help carry his lame brother end of fable 161 fable 162 the two dogs and the dead ass the virtues must surely sisters be for that vices are brothers we all well know and if but to one a man's heart be free all the others like hurricanes inward blow yet of course both of virtues and vices tis true that one heart holds but of either few and not more than once in an age we see the virtues in one small heart agree for if a man be valiant tis sure in a thousand cases he's also rash and if he be prudent the greed for more will that respectable virtue dash above all animals beside in faithfulness the dog takes pride but far too oft for food he craves and even dogs are folly's slaves two mastiffs on a certain day beheld a donkey's carcass floating and fain had seized it for their prey but baffling winds deceived their gloating at length one said your eyes are good my friend so look on yonder flood and tell me what is that i see if savoury ox or horse it be of what it is replied the other what boots it friend to make a bother for dogs like us in want of food even a scurvy ass is good the thing that now the most concerns us is how to swim to such a distance against this plaguy wind's resistance but stay let's quench the thirst that burns us by drinking up the river dry and when we've quenched our thirst we'll pass and gorge us on that savoury ass with haste the mastiffs now began to quaff the river as it ran but well a day it came to pass that long ere they had reached the ass the twain had long since quenched their thirst and still persisting nobly burst with us weak mortals tis the same when eager seeking wealth or fame what is hopeless seems not so so on from ill to ill we go a king whose states are amply round will conquer still to make them square and wealthy men with gold to spare sigh for just fifty thousand pound whilst others just as foolish seek to learn all science hebrew greek in short we most of us agree tis easy work to drain the sea a mortal man to carry out the projects of his single soul would need four bodies strong and stout and then would not complete the whole for even should his life extend to twice methuselah's depend ten thousand years would find him still where he began the total nil end of fable 162 this recording is in the public domain. Fables 163 and 164 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 163 The Advantage of Being Clever between two citizens there once arose a quarrel furious the one was poor but full of knowledge ripe rare and curious 
the other had not been to college and was though rich a perfect dunce he far too fondly oft proclaimin the items of his hoarded pelf declared that learned men but came in a rank far underneath himself the man was quite a fool and i can never understand the why or wherefore wealth alone should place a man above the learned race the rich one to the wise one said full often is your table spread as well as mine and if not tell what boots it that you read so well night after night you sadly clamber to the dull third floor's backmost chamber and in december's cold you wear what in hot june would be to bear whilst as for servants you have none unless you call your shadow one alack explain to me the fate of this or any other state if all were there like you and i spent nothing on my luxury we rich ones use our wealth god knows and forth from us to artisan to tradesman and to courtesan in glorious golden floods it flows and even you, who write your works, chiefly to use your knives and forks, of rich financiers get your meed of what you call our hoarded greed. These foolish words need scarce be sad, simply contemptuous answer had. The wise men had too much to say, in answer, and so went away. But worse than sarcasm, the sword of rough invader met the horde of him who had the wealth the town in which he dwelt was toppled down they left the city and the one who ignorant was was soon undone and met all men's contempt whilst he who knew the sciences was free of all men call society the quarrel so at last was ended but this is what i always say in spite of the fools yea or nay the wise must be commended End of fable. 163 fable 164 the wolf and the hunter o avarice thou monster mad for gain whose mind takes us in but one idea of good how often shall i use my words in vain when shall my tales by thee be understood o when will man with heart so cold still ever heaping gold on gold deaf to the bard as to the wise at length from his dull drudgery rise and learn how sagely to employ it towards this course make haste my friend for human life has soon an end and yet again a volume in one word compressing i tell you wealth is only when enjoyed a blessing well you reply to-morrow twill be done my friend you may not see to-morrow's sun ah like the hunter and the wolf you'll find tis hard to die and leave your wealth behind a hunter having deftly slain a stag of ten beheld a doe so having taken aim again upon the green sward laid it low this booty was sufficient quite for modest hunter's appetite but lo a boar of form superb starting from the tangled herb tempted the archer's greed anew but bow was twanged the arrow flew with futile shears the sister dread had frayed his boarship's vital thread full grimly did she now resume the work at her tartarian loom nor yet achieved the monster's doom not yet content nor ever will be he who once has quaffed the cup of victory the boar has just begun to rise when swift a red-legged partridge flies right in the greedy hunter's view a wretched prize tis very true compared with those already got and yet the sportsman takes a shot but ere the triggers pulled the boar grown stronger for just one effort more the hunter slays and on him dies with thanks away the partridge flies the covetous shall have the best the miserly may take the rest a wolf that passing by took note of this sad scene said i devote to mistress luck a sumptuous fane what for corpses for together slain it seems scarce true but i must be prudent midst this satiety for such good seldom comes to me this is of many vain excuses the one the miser mostly uses 
enough the wolf continued here to give me for a month good cheer four bodies with four weeks will fit but nathless i will wait a bit and first this hunter's bowstring chew for scent proclaims it catgut true thus saying on the bow he flings his hungry form when taking wings the undischarged bolt quickly flies through the wolf's carcase and he dies and now my text i will repeat wealth only when enjoyed is sweet o reader from these gluttons twain take warning ere it be too late through greed was the keen hunter slain through hoarding up wolf met his fate end of fable one sixty four this recording is in the public domain Fables 165 and 166 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. Jupiter and the Thunderbolts Jove, viewing from on high our faults, said one day in cerulean vaults, let us plenish the earth with the race of new guests, for those of Noah's birth quite weary me out with their endless requests fly to hell mercury and bring unto me the fury most fierce and most grim of the three for that race that i've cherished will all soon have perished thus passionate jupiter spoke but quickly from anger awoke and so let me warn you o kings of whom jupiter makes the mere strings to rule and to guide as you will for a brief moment pause to examine the cause ere you torture your subjects or kill the god with light feet and whose tongue honey sweet went as ordered to visit the fates tisiphone looked at megira then mocked at and after inspection fixed his choice of all persons on ugly electon rendered proud by this choice with a horrible voice the goddess declared in the caverns of death that she'd stop all men's breath and not one live thing on the earth should be spared unto mercy's straight path jove came back from his wrath annulled the humanity's oath nothing loath yet his thunders he threw at the vile mortal crew and one might have thought that destruction were wrought but the fact was just this the bolts managed to miss for the thunderer's pride with our fears satisfied he was father of men and so he knew when as papa's mortal know too what distance to throw to but with mercy thus treated man with wickedness heated grew so vicious at last that jove swore he would cast and crush our weak race their creator's disgrace but yet he still smiled for a father his child strikes with a merciful hand so at last it was planned that god vulcan should have the duty of sending us men to the grave with bolts of two sorts vulcan fills his black courts and of these two there's one that heaven throws straight when it fills up its hate and the thread of a man's life is done the other falls only on mountain tops lonely and this kind alone by great jupiter's throne the falcon and the capon a treacherous voice will sometimes call hear it but trust it not at all not meaningless the thing i tell but like the clog of jean nivelle a citizen of mons by trade a capon one day was dismayed being summoned very suddenly before his master's larries he disliked that tribunal the spit it was a foul of ready wit yet all the folks their scheme to hide coop 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 so softly cried your servant your gross bait is vain you won't catch me i say again all this a falcon saw perplexed what had the silly creature vexed instinct experience or no fowls have no faith in us i know and this one caught with endless trouble to-morrow in a pot would bubble or in a stately dish repose small honour as the capon knows the falcon the poor creature blamed 
I am astonished. I am ashamed. You scum. You canaille. How you act. You're half an idiot. That's a fact. I come back to my master's fist and hunt for him whate'er he list. Why, see, he's at the window there. You're deaf. He's calling, I declare. I know too well, the fowl replied, not caring for the falcon's pride. What does he want to say to me? The cook has got his knife, I see. Would you attend to such a bait? Now let me fly, or I'm too late, so cease to mock. Nay, now, good master, that wheedling voice portends disaster. Had you seen at the friendly hearth as many falcons of good birth as I've seen capons put to roast, you'd not reproach me with vain boast. End of Fable 166「Fables 167 and 168 by Jean de la Fontaine」translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 167 – The Two Pigeons Two pigeons once as brother, brother, with two affection loved each other, but one of them foolishly tired of home, resolved to distant lands to roam. Then the other one said with piteous tear, What brother, and would you then leave me here? Of all the ills that on earth we share, absence from loved ones is bitterest woe. And if to your heart this feeling strange, let the dangers of travel your purpose change. And oh, at least for the springtide wait. I heard a crow on a neighboring tree, just now predicting an awful fate. For some wretched bird, and I foresee, falcons and snares awaiting thee. What more can you want than what you've got? A friend, a good dwelling, and wholesome cot. The other by these pleadings shaken, almost had his whim forsaken, but still by restless ardor swayed. Soon in soothing tones he said, Weep not, brother, I'll not stay, but for three short days away. And then, quite satisfied, returning, impart to you my traveled learning. Who stays at home has naught to say, but I will have such things to tell. Twas there I went, it thus befell, that you will think that you have been, in every action, every scene. Thus having said, he bade adieu, and forth on eager pinion flew. But ere a dozen miles were past, the skies with clouds grew overcast. All drenched with rain, the pigeon sought a tree whose shelter was but naught. And when at length the rain was o'er, he draggled wings could scarcely soar. Soon after this a field espying, whereon some grains of corn were lying, he saw another pigeon there, and straight resolved to have his share. So down he flies and finds too late, the treacherous corn is only there, to tempt poor birds to hapless fate. As the net was torn and old, however, with beak and claw and fluttering wing, and by despair's supreme endeavor, he quickly broke string after string, and with the loss of half his plumes, joyous his flight once more resumes. But cruel fate had yet in store a sadder evil than before. For as our pigeon slowly flew, and bits of net behind him drew, like felon from prison just scaped, a hawk his course towards him shaped. And now the pigeon's life were ended, but that just then with wings extended, an eagle on the hawk descended, leaving the thieves to fight it out. With beak and talon, helter-skelter, the pigeon neath the wall takes shelter, and now believes without a doubt that for his present time released, the series of his woes has ceased. But lo, a cruel boy of ten, that age knows not compassion's name, Whirling his sling with deadly aim, half kills the hapless bird, who then, with splintered wing, half dead and lame, his zeal for travel deeply cursing, goes home to seek his brother's nursing. By hook or by crook he hobbled along, and arrived at home without further wrong, then united once more and safe from blows, the brothers forgot their recent woes. O oh, lover, happy lovers, never separate, I say, but by the nearest rivulet your wandering footsteps stay. 
let each unto the other be a world that's ever fair ever varied in its aspects ever young and debonair let each be dear to each and as nothing count the rest i myself have sometimes been by a lover's ardor blessed and then i'd not have changed for any palace here below for all that in the heavens in lustrous splendor glow the woods and lanes and fields which were lightened by the eyes which were gladdened by the feet of that shepherdess so fair so sweet and good and young to whom bound by cupid's ties fast bound i thought for ever i first breathed my oaths in air alas shall such sweet moments be never more for me shall my restless soul no more on earth such tender objects see oh if i dared to venture on the lover's path again should i still find sweet contentment in cupid's broad domain or is my heart grown torpid are my aspirations vain end of fable one sixty seven fable one sixty eight education caesar and laridon his brother both suckled by the same dear mother sprang from an ancient royal race right hardy in the toiling chase two masters shared the noble brood and won the kitchen won the wood made his home yet still the same they both kept their former name place and custom altered them in their nature not in limb the one dog purchased by the cook laridon for title took his brother to renown soon soars slays by dozens stags and boars soon as caesar he was known and as wonderful was shown but for laridon none cared or his children how they fared so the turnspits spread through france vulgar dogs that toil or dance timid creatures as one sees caesar's true antipodes time neglect and luckless fate make a race degenerate wise men's sons turn simpletons caesars become laridons end of fable one sixty eight this recording is in the public domain fables one hundred and sixty nine and one hundred and seventy by jean de la fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Fable 169 The Madman Who Sold Wisdom. Never get in a madman's reach. Ye wise men, listen to my speech. It's my advice, or right or wrong, to flee from such crazed folk headlong. In courts you often see them stalk. The prince smiles at them in his walk. To rogue and fool, and the buffoon, they serve for jokes from morn to noon. A madman once in market place said he sold wisdom. The dolts race to buy the treasure. What fun is his watching the silly people's fizzes when for their money they obtain a blow that gives their red ears pain and forty yards of common thread? Some were indignant. They instead of pity only mockery got. The best way was to bear one's lot and walk off laughing, or else go home and not talk about the blow. To ask the meaning of all this was to secure a wise man's hiss. There is no reason in such folks. Tis chance begets such crazy jokes, and yet the thread it was mysterious. One of the dupes who took it serious went to consult a sage he knew, who replied thus at the first view these hieroglyphics i can see people of sense infallibly between themselves and madmen place at least some fathoms of this lace or else they will a buffet gain and never much redress obtain you are not gulled a crazy fool has sold you wisdom from his school fable one hundred and seventy the cat and the rat four animals of nature's various living lives the most precarious together dwelt and yet apart close to and even within the heart of a most ancient pine the one was master cat who claws another master rat who gnaws the weasel third with waist so fine and of a very ancient line 
the fourth was sapient master owl whose midnight hoot disturbs the ghoul one night a man about their tree a snare disposed with secrecy and master cat at early dawn from couch with hope of plunder drawn scarce half awake fell plump within the cruelly invented gin such caterwauling then arose that master gnaw cheese hurried round to see in fetters safely bound the deadliest of his special foes then master purrer softly cried sir rat your true benevolence is known in all the country wide so pray for pity take me hence from this atrocious strangling snare in which i've fallen unaware tis strange but true that you alone of all the rats i've ever known have won my heart and thank the skies i've loved you more than both my eyes twas just as i was on my way as all devout ones should to pray at early dawn that i was pent within this cursed instrument my life is in your hands my friend pray with your tooth these shackles rend but curtly then replied the rat pray say what i should gain by that my friendship true for evermore the cat replied these talons grim shall be your guard the owl no more should watch your nest the weasel's limb shall never make of you his meat not such a fool replied the rat am i as to release a cat and forthwith sought his snug retreat but near the narrow hole he sought the weasel watched perhaps meaning naught still further upward climbed the rat to where the great owl grimly sat at last by dangers menaced round sir Norcheese once more seeks the ground and working hard with practised grinder relieves poor puss from cords that bind her the task is just completed when the ruthless man appears and overwhelmed with equal fears the new allies by different paths retreated soon after this adventure the cat beheld one sunny day snug in a place from cats secure his friend the rat and said i pray come let's embrace we are friends again it gives me on my word true pain to think that one to whom i owe my life should deem me still his foe and do you think replied the rat that i am ignorant of a cat i know within your bosom lies the germ of all hypocrisies to trust to friendships that rogues feign is leaning on a straw tis plain end of fable one hundred and seventy this recording is in the public domain fables one hundred seventy one and one hundred seventy two by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornbury read for librivox dot org by eva davis democritus and the anderanians how i the base and vulgar hate profane unjust and obstinate so ever prone with lip and eye to turn the truth to calumny the master of great epicurus suffered from this rabble once which shows e'en learning can't secure us from the malice of the dunce by all the people of his town was cried democritus is mad but in his own land well tis known no prophet credit ever had the truth within a nutshell lies his friends were fools and he was wise the error spread to such extent that at length a deputation with letters from abdera's nation to famed hippocrates was sent with humble earnest hope that he for madness might find remedy our fellow townsmen weeping said the deputation lost his head through too much reading would that he had only read as much as we to know how truly he insane is he says for instance not more plain is than that this earth is only one a million others round the sun and all these shining worlds are full of people wise as well as dull and not content with dreaming thus with theories strange he puzzles us asserting that his brain consists of some queer kind of airy mists and more than this he says that though he measures stars from earth below 
what he himself is he don't know long since in friendly conversation he was the wit of all the nation but now alone he'll talk and mumble so great physician if you can pray come and cure this poor old man hippocrates by all this jumble was not deceived but still he went and here we see how accident can bring such meetings tween ourselves as scarce could manage be by elves hippocrates arrived to find that he whom all men called a fool was sage and wise and calm and cool still searching for the innate mind in heart and brain of beast and man retired beneath a leafy grove through which a murmuring brooklet ran the sage with patient ardor strove the labyrinths of a skull to scan beside him lay full many a scroll by ancients written and his soul was wrapped in learned thought so holy that scarce he saw his friend advance their greeting was but just a glance for sages right well know the folly of idle compliment and word so throwing off all forms absurd they spoke in language large and free of man his soul and destiny and then discussed the secret springs which move all bad or holy things but tis not meet that i rehearse such weighty words in humble verse from this short story we may see how much at fault the mob may be and this being so pray tell me why some venture to proclaim aloud that in the clamour of the crowd we hear the voice of deity the oyster and its claimants two travellers discovered on the beach an oyster carried thither by the sea twas eyed with equal greediness by each then came the question whose it was to be one stooping down to pounce upon the prize was thrust away before his hand could snatch it not quite so quickly his companion cries if you've a claim here i've a claim to match it the first that saw it has the better right to its possession come you can't deny it well said his friend my orbs are pretty bright and i upon my life was first to spy it you not at all or if you did perceive it i smelt it long before it was in view but here's a lawyer coming let us leave it to him to arbitrate between the two the lawyer listens with a stolid face arrives at his decision in a minute and as the shortest way to end the case opens the shell and cats the fish within it the rivals look upon him with dismay this court says he awards you each a shell you've neither of you any cost to pay and so be happy go in peace farewell how often when causes to trial are brought does the lawyer get pelf and the client get not the former will pocket his fees with a sneer while the latter sneaks off with a flea in his ear end of fable 172by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. The fraudulent trustee. Animals I've sung in verse, memory's daughters aiding. Perhaps I should have done far worse in other heroes trading in my book the dogs sit down with wolves in conversation and beasts dressed up in vest and gown all sorts of every nation reflect each kind of folly duly my verse interprets them so truly fools there are and wise there are but my heroes i can't flatter for tis certain that by far the former ones exceed the latter swindlers i have painted often brutes whom kindness cannot soften tyrants flatterers and the crew who take your gifts then bite at you in my pages you'll find many 
examples of the utter zany but chiefly have i had to do with those who say what is not true the ancient wise man cried aloud all men are liars had he stated this fact but of the wretched crowd even then i should have hesitated but that we mortals great and small both good and bad are liars all i should deny it once of course did i not know the maxim source but he who lies as aesop lies or to go a little higher as old homer is no liar for the charming dreams we prize with which they have enriched the world our brightest truths in fiction furled the works of such should live forever but he who lies like them lies never but he who should attempt to lie as a fraudulent trustee did a liar is most certainly and should suffer for as he did the story tells us that proposing to journey into foreign lands a merchant in the persian trade in friends all confidence reposing agreement with a neighbor made to leave some iron in his hands my metal said he coming back your metal tis all gone alack a rat has eaten up the lot i've scolded all my slaves god wot but in spite of all control a granary floor will have a hole the merchant opened well his eyes and never hinted aught of lies but soon he stole his neighbor's child and then he asked the rogue to dine to which the other answered wild with anguish sir i must decline i love the child i have but one i have what say i i have none for he is stolen then replies the merchant with my own two eyes on yester eve at close of day i saw your offspring borne away with many a struggle many a howl to an old ruin by an owl an owl the father cried convey to such a height so big a prey my son could kill a dozen such for my belief this is too much i do not that deny replies his friend yet saw it with these eyes and wherefore should you think it strange that in a land where rats can steal a ton of iron from a grange an owl should seize a boy of ten fly with him to his lofty den and of him make a hearty meal the fraudulent trustee perceived which way the artful story tended gave back the goods the man received his child and so the matter ended between two travellers on their road dispute arose in a strange mode the one a story-teller such as oft are met with who can't touch on any great or trivial topic without the use that is abuse of lenses microscopic with them all objects are gigantic small ponds grow huge as the atlantic the present instance said he knew a cabbage once that grew so tall it topped a lofty garden wall i'm sure replied his friend tis true for i myself a pot have met within which no large church could get the first one such a pot derided softly my friend rejoined the second you quite without your host have reckoned to boil your cabbage was my pot provided the man of the monstrous pot was a wag the man of the iron adroit and if ever you meet with a man who'll brag never attempt to stint him a doit 
but match his long bow with your strong bow. Fable 174 Jupiter and the Traveler The gods our perils would make wealthy, if we our vows remembered when once made. But dangers past, and we, all safe and healthy, forget the promises on altars laid. We only think of what we owe to men. Jove, says the atheist, is a creditor, who never sends out bailiffs. If so, then, what is the thunder meant as warning for? A passenger, in tempest tossed and rolled, to Jupiter, a hundred oxen offered. He hadn't one, had he been only bold. A hundred elephants he would have proffered. They cost him not a single farthing more. Suddenly mounted unto great Jove's nose, the scent of beef bones burnt upon the shore. Accept my promised vow, the rascal crows. Tis ox you smell, the smoke is all for thee. Now we are quits. Jove smiled a bitter smile. But some days after, sent a dream to be the recompense of that man's wicked guile. The dream informed him where a treasure lay. The man ran to it like a moth to flame. Some robbers seized him, having naught to pay. He promised them at once, if they but came, where he'd a hundred talents of good gold. The place far off pleased not the wary thieves. And one man said, my comrade, I am told, you mock us, and he dies, whoever deceives. Go and take Pluto for an offering, your hundred talents, they will please the king. End of Fable 174 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 175 and 176 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Fable 175 The Ape and the Leopard An ape and a leopard one day repair Money to gain to a country fair and setting up separate booths they vie each with each in the arts of cajolery come see me cries leopard come gentlemen come the price of admissions a very small sum to the great in all places my fame is well known and should death overtake me the king on his throne would be glad of a robe from my skin, for tis mottled and wattled and stained and ingrained with spots and with lines, lines and spots, thick and thin, that truly, though modest, I can but declare, tis by far the most wonderful thing in the fair. This bounce attained its end, and so the gulls came hurrying to the show but the sight seen and the cash spent they went away in discontent meanwhile the ape cries come and see the sum of versatility yon leopard boasts through thick and thin a splendid show of outside skin but many varied gifts i have for which your kind applause i crave all safely lodged my brain within your servant i monsieur guffaw the noble bertrand's son-in-law chief monkey to his holiness the pope i now have come express in three huge ships to have with you the honour of an interview for speaking is my special forte and i can dance and hoops jump through and other kinds of tumbling do. 
and magic feats perform of every sort and for six blancos no i say a so but if with the performance you are discontented at the door to each his money we'll restore and right was the ape for the colour and shape of fine clothes can but please for a while whilst the charms of a brain that is witty remain and for ever can soothe and beguile ah there's many a one lord and gentleman's son who holds high estate here below who to leopards akin has naught but fine skin as the sum of his merits to show fable one seventy six the acorn and the gourd all that jove does is wise and good i need not travel far abroad to make this maxim understood but take example from a gourd observing once a pumpkin of bulk so huge on stem so small what meant he cried a bumpkin great jove i mean who made us all by such an act capricious if my advice were asked by heaven to yonder oaks the gourds were given and twould have been judicious for sure it is good taste to suit to monstrous trees a monstrous fruit and truly tony had but he whom the priests talk of asked of me advice on here and there a point things would not be so out of joint for why to take this plain example should not the acorn here be hung for it is this tiny stem is ample whilst on the oak the pumpkin swung the more i view this sad abortion of all the laws of true proportion the more i'm sure the lord of thunder has made a very serious blunder teased by this matter tony cries one soon grows weary when one's wise then dozing neath an oak he lies now as he slept an acorn fell straight on his nose and made it swell at once awake he seeks to trace with eager hand what hurt his face and in his beard the acorn caught discovers what the pain had wrought and now by injured nose induced our friend takes up a different tone i bleed i bleed he makes his moan and all this is by this thing produced but oh if from the tree instead a full-grown gourd had struck my head ah jove most wise has made decree that acorns only deck the tree and now i quite the reason see thus in a better frame of mind homeward went our honest kind end of fable 176 this recording is in the public domain Fables 177 and 178 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 177, The Schoolboy, the Pedant, and the Nursery Gardener. A certain boy, half spoiled at school, your pedants spoil lads as a rule, ten times a fool, ten times a rogue they'd made this mischievous young dog a neighbor's flowers and fruits he stole a man who struggled heart and soul to raise pomona's choicest treasurer in what was bad he had no pleasure each season did its tribute bring and flora's gifts were his in spring one day he saw upon a tree the boy climb up and recklessly spoil half the buds the promised year a future plenty for the year he even broke the boughs at last 
the gardener to the school ran fast the master came with all his train of lads of what does he complain the orchard's full of dreadful boys worse than the first in tricks and noise the pedant though he meant not toe made the first evil double grow the pedant was so eloquent about the sin and ill intent it was a lesson not forgot by the whole school an ill-taught lot he often cites the mantuan bard at rhetoric toils hot and hard so long as speech the wicked race had time enough to spoil the place i hate your misplaced eloquence endless ill-timed and without sense and no fool i detest so bad as an ill-taught and thievish lad except his master yet the best of these is a bad neighbor tis confessed end of fable one seventy seven fable one seventy eight the cat and the fox the fox and cat two saints indeed to make a pilgrimage agreed two artful hypocrites they were soft-footed sly and smooth and fair full many a fowl and many a cheese made up for loss of time and ease the road was long and weary too to shorten it to talk they flew for argument drives sleep away and helps a journey on they say the fox to the cat says my friend to be so clever you pretend say what am i i've in this sack a hundred tricks well on my back the other very timid said i've only one i'm quite afraid but that i hold is worth a dozen my enemies to cheat and cousin then the dispute began anew with so say i and i tell you till suddenly some hounds in sight silence them soon as it well might the cat cries search your bag my friend or you are lost you may depend choose out your choicest stratagem puss climbed a tree and baffled them the fox a hundred burrows sought turned dodged and doubled as he thought to put the terriers at fault and shun their rough and rude assault in every place he tried for shelter but begged it vainly helter-skelter the hounds were on the treacherous scent that still betrayed where'er he went at last as from a hole he started two swift dogs on poor reynard darted then came up all the yelping crew and at his throat at once they flew too many schemes spoil everything we lose our time in settling have only one as wise man should but let that one be sound and good. End of Fable 178. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 179 and 180 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Sculptor and the Statue of Jupiter. A block of marble shone so white, a sculptor bought it, and that night said, Now, my chisel, let's decree, God, tank, or table shall it be. We'll have a god, the dream I clasp, his hand a thunderbolt shall grasp. Tremble, ye monarchs, ere it's hurled, behold the master of the world. So well the patient workman wrought in stone the vision of his thought, the people cried at last, beseech the gods to grant it power of speech some even dared the crowd to tell that when the chisel's last blow fell the sculptor was the first with dread to turn away his trembling head the ancient poets not to blame for weak man's terror fear and shame the gods invented in each age abhorring human hate and rage the sculptor was a child confess his mind like children's in distress tormented by this ceaseless sorrow his doll might angry be to-morrow the heart obeys its guide the mind and from the source there flows we find this pagan error which we see widen to all infinity we all embrace some favorite dream and follow it down flood and stream pygmalion was in love tis said 
with venus that himself had made each turns his dream into a truth and tries to fancy it all sooth ice to the facts before his face but burning falsehood to embrace the mouse metamorphosed into a girl a mouse from the beak of an owl fell down a brahmin lifted it up half dead tenderly nursed it and tamed it and fed i could not have done such an act i own but every land has its own conceit with a mouse i'd rather not sit at meat but brahmins regard a flea as a friend for they think that the soul of a king may descend to some beast or insect or dog or mite pythagoras taught them this law erudite thus believing the brahmin a sorcerer prayed that the mouse might resume some more elegant dress the wise man consented and truth to confess performed his task well for the mouse became maid ah a maid of fifteen such an elegant creature of a form so genteel of such exquisite feature that if paris had met her that amorous boy would have risked to possess her full many a troy the brahmin said darling you've but to declare whom you'll have for a husband for none will refuse such a beautiful bride you have only to choose then the maiden replied i confess that i long for a husband that's valiant and noble and strong then the brahmin knelt down and addressing the sun cried noblest of living things you are the one but the lord of the daylight replied tis not true that i am so strong for the cloud you see yonder piled high with the rain and the hail and the thunder could hide me at once if he chose from your view to the cloud then appealing the brahmin declared that with him lord of storms his child's fate should be shared no no said the dark cloud it never can be for at each breath of wind i am driven to flee if you'd have for a son-in-law somebody strong your maid to the north wind should fairly belong disgusted with constant refusals like these the brahmin appealed to the wild roving breeze and the breeze was quite willing to wed the fair maid but a mountain-top huge his love's pilgrimage stayed the ball at this game of a lover to find now passed to the hill but he quickly declined for said he with the rat i'm not friends and i know if i took the fair maid he would gnaw at me so at the mention of rat the fair maiden with glee cried tis rat and rat only my husband shall be see a girl for a rat now apollo forsaking it was one of those strokes which love glories in making and twixt you and me such strange instances are mongst girls that we know of more frequent than rare with men and with beasts it is ever the same they still show the trace of the place whence they came and this fable may aid us to prove it but yet on a nearer inspection some sophistries met in its traits for to trust to this fanciful story any spouse were more good than the sun in his glory but what shall i say that a giant is less than a flea because fleas can a giant distress the rat if this rule must be strictly obeyed of his wife to the cat would a present have made and the cat to the dog and the dog to the bear till at length by a sort of a high winding stair the story had brought us where first twas begun and the beautiful maid would have married the sun but let us return to the metempsychosis the truth of which firstly this fable supposes it seems to me plain that the fable itself the system decidedly puts on the shelf according to brahmin law animals all that inhabit the earth be they mighty or small be they men mice or wolves or e'en creatures more coarse their souls have derived from one general source and vary in physical actions just so as the form of their organs may force them to do and if this be the case then how came it that one of so fine formed a frame did not wed with the sun whereas as we know to a rat she devoted the charms on which many a king would have doted all things considered all declare that girl and mouse souls different are 
we must our destiny fulfill as ordered by the sovereign will appeal to magic it is all in vain the soul once born will still the same remain end of fable 180 this recording is in the public domain Fables 181 and 182 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Fable 181 The Monkey and the Cat Bertrand and Raton, a monkey and a cat, were messmates in mischief with roguery fat. There was nothing they feared, there was nothing they spared, and whatever they plundered, they usually shared if anything close by was stealable they would never go foraging out of their way bertrand stole everything raton to please and raton cared less for the mice than the cheese one day at the fire when all clear was the coast the pair were both spying some chestnuts at roast to steal a good meal is its pleasure to double besides it would bring the cook's man into trouble says bertrand to raton my brother you see fate's given a moment of glory to thee get those chestnuts and quickly my brave one i pray the gods have vouchsafed us a dinner to-day and so to snatch chestnuts poor raton agreed and at once set to work on the dangerous deed with gingerly touch he the cinders withdrew and snatched the hot prices first one and then two he has pilfered quite half but has not eaten one the eating his comrade bertrand has done a scullion comes there's a due to the theft and raton is empty and querulous left your nobles are much in a similar case who as flatterers dangerous service embrace and to gratify kings fingers often will burn then homeward the wiser still poorer return fable one hundred and eighty two the wolf and the starved dog once on a time a little carp to man preached all in vain they put him in the pan and i repeat tis foolish to let slip the glass that's full and halfway to the lip in hopes of better wine the fish was wrong the fisherman was right his reason strong one speaks out boldly when a life's to save it needs some eloquence king death to wave but still i hold i'm right and don't demure if from my former text i do not stir a wolf less wise than our good fisherman meeting a dog outside the village ran to bear him off the poor dog pleaded hard that he was thin and not worth his regard my lord i shall not please you that is pat wait till the marriage i shall then grow fat and quite myself when master's daughters wed the wolf believed all that the terrier said the day expired he came with faith to see if good had come from this festivity to wolf without the dog spoke through the gate friend i am coming if you'll only wait the porter of our lodge is coming too we'll soon be ready sir to wait on you the porter was a mastiff you must know ready to crunch up wolves and at one blow the caller paused your servant i remain he said and ran and sought the wood again swift but not clever the remark was made this wolf was not a master of his trade. End of Fable 182. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 183 and 184 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Roger Mathewson, Exeter, England, February. 2017 fable 183 the wax candle from heaven the bees came down they say and on hymettus's top one day settled and from sweet zephyr's flowers stole all the treasures and strange powers and when the ambrosia from each field long in their storerooms close concealed was to speak simple french all taken and the mere empty comb forsaken many wax tapers from it made were sold by those to whom that trade belongs 
one of these candles long and thick seeing clay hardened into brick by fire made to endure for eye like an empedocles to die resolved to perish in the flame a foolish martyr seating fame he leapt in headlong reasoning vain small wisdom in his empty brain no human beings like another one cannot argue from one's brother empedocles burnt up like paper yet wasn't madder than this taper fable one hundred and eighty four not too much i find in no one race or nation of men what i call moderation both animals and plants do err in this respect i must aver nature's great master wished that we should guard the golden mean you see but do we no and once more no whether to good or ill we go the corn that ceres from her hand spreads lavish o'er the fertile land too richly grows and drains the ground luxuriant and without a bound so that from rank and crowded grain all nourishments the deep roots drain the trees spread likewise heedlessly to check the corn god graciously gives us the sheep to check ill growth amid the corn they nothing loath plunge headlong and so the ruthless spoil the slow result of peasants toil then heaven sends the wolf to thin the sheep they gobble kith and kin if they spare one tis not their fault they're but too ready to assault then man the speedy punishment and to the cruel wolves is sent next man far worst of all abuses the divine power he rashly uses man of all animals yet known is more disposed to this i own little or great and to excess we carry all things i confess no soul that lives but errs i see in this respect continually the good text not too much is met often but never practised yet end of fable eighty four this recording is in the public domain fables one eighty five and one eighty six by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornberry and read for librivox dot org by kurt from tucson arizona fable one eighty five the two rats the fox and the egg to madame de la sablière iris it were easy quite verses in your praise to write were not that scornful you refuse the plaintive homage of my muse in that unlike your sister's fair who any weight of praise can bear most women dote on flattery's lies nor are they on this point unwise for if it be a crime tis one that gods and monarchs fail to shun that nectar which the poets say is quaffed by him who holds the sway or thunders and which kings on earth get drunk on from their earliest birth is flattery iris flattery such as you'll not even deign to touch no iris you have rich resources in genuine wit and wise discourses sometimes half earnest sometimes gay the world believes it not they say let the poor world think what it may in conversation i maintain that truth and jokes are equal gain pure science well may be the stay of friendly converse but the ray of mirth should ever and anon electric light friends union discourse when rightly comprehended is with a thousand graces blended and much resembles garden sweet where flora's various beauties meet and where the bees search every bloom and from each bush bring honey home allowing this to be so let some theories in my tales be met theories philosophic new engaging subtle have not you heard speak of them their holders say that animals are mere machines and move but by mechanic means that move or gamble as they may they move but blindly have no soul no feeling heart no self-control but are like watches which set going work on without their object knowing if 
we should open one of these what is it the eye within them sees a score of tiny wheels we find the first is moved then close behind a second follows then a third and so on till the hour is heard to hark to these philosophers the heart is such some object stirs a certain nerve and straight again a fellow nerve endures the strain and so on till the sense it reaches and some deep vital lesson teaches but how's it done these theorists cry tis done by pure necessity that neither will nor even passion assist in it in any fashion that moved by some inherent force the beast is sent to run the course of love and grief joy pain and hate or any other varied state a watch may be a watch and go compelled by springs but tis not so with us and here twere wise to ask descartes to aid us in our task descartes who in the times of eld had for a deity been held and who between mere men and spirits holds such a place by special merits as twixt man and oyster has that patient animal the ass he reasons thus and boldly says of all the animals that dwell on this round world i know full well my brain alone has reason's rays now iris you will recollect twas taught by us that older science on which we use to have reliance that when beasts think they don't reflect descartes goes farther and maintains that beasts are quite devoid of brains this you believe with ease and so can i until to woods i go just when perchance some motley crew with dogs and horns a stag pursue in vain it doubles and confounds with many a devious turn the hounds at length this ancient stag of ten discovering all its efforts then and almost wholly worn and spent drives by main force from covert near athwart the dog some younger deer to tempt them off by fresher scent what reasoning here the beast displays its backward tracks on beaten ways its numerous schemes its scent to smother and skill at length to thrust another on danger almost at its feet for some great party chief were meet and worthy of some better fate than death from dogs insatiate tis thus the red-legged partridge sprung by pointer strives to save her young and yet unfledged with piteous cries and lagging wing she feigns to rise runs on then halts then hurries on again and dog and hunter tempts across the plain and when her nest is far enough behind she laughs at both and skims along the wind tis said that beings have been found in distant lands in northern climes who still in ignorance profound are steeped as in primeval times but only of the men i speak for their four-footed creatures break the force of streams by dams and ridges and join opposing banks by bridges beams mortised well with beams their toil resist the streams attempt to spoil each laborer with the other vies and old ones guide young energize chief engineers the whole survey and point out aught that goes astray pluto's well-ordered state could never have vied with these amphibians clever in snows they build their houses high and pass o'er pools on bridges dry such is their prudence art and skill whilst men like us around them still if they perchance should have the whim a distant shore to reach must swim now spite of all this evidence convinces me of beaver's sense but still my point to make more clear i will a story here relate which but lately met my ear from lips of one who rules in state a king i mean and one whose glory soars high on wings of victory the polish prince whose name alone spreads terror round the turkish throne that king can lie not is well known he says then that his frontiers wide are edged by wilds where beasts reside who warfare wage and veterate and to their sons transmit their hate these beasts are fox-like says the king and to their wars such arts they bring that neither this nor any age has seen men with like skill engage 
all pickets sentinels and spies with ambuscades and treacherize that she who from Styx's entrails came and unto heroes gives their fame invented has for man's perdition these beasts employ with erudition to sing their battles we should have homer restored us from the grave and oh that he who epicurus rivals once more could reassure us that whatever beasts may do is to mechanic means but do that all their minds corporeal are that building houses making war they are but agents weak and blind of some mere watchspring in the mind the object which their sense attacks returning fills its former tracks and straightway in their bestial pates the image seen before creates without that thought or sense or soul have o'er the thing the least control but men a different station fill and scorning instinct use their will i speak i walk and feel within something to godlike power akin distinct from all my flesh and bone it lives a life that's all its own yet o'er my flesh it rules alone but how can soul be understood by what is merely flesh and blood there lies the point the tool by hand is guided who guides the hand has not yet been decided ah what is that strange power which wings the planets on their heavenly way doth each some angel lord obey and are my spirit's secret springs moved and controlled the self-same way my soul obeys some influence i know not what it is nor whence that secret must for ever lie hid by god's awful majesty descartes knew just as much as i in other things he may supplant all men he's here as ignorant but iris this at least i know that no such lofty souls endow the beasts of whom i've made example of soul man only is the temple yet must we to the beasts accord some sense the plant world can't afford and even plants have humble lives but let me add one story still and let me know how much your skill of moral from its facts derives two rats seeking something to eat found an egg for such folks to have something to eat is sufficient and seldom or never you'll find that they beg of the gods turtle soup or french cook proficient full of appetite nimbly down they sat to eat and soon from the shell would have drawn out the meat when a fox in the distance appeared to molest them and a question arose which most greatly distressed them no other as you may suppose but the way the egg from sir reynard's keen snout to convey to drag it behind them or roll it on floor to pack it behind them or shove it before were the plans tried in turn but were all tried in vain when at length the old mother of arts made it plain that if one on his back held the egg in his paw the other from danger could readily draw the plan was successful in spite of some jolting and we leave the two sages their pleasant meal bolting who shall after this declare that beasts devoid of reason air for my part i'll to beasts allow the sense that dwells in childhood's brow reason from childhood's earliest years in all its acts and ways appears and so it seems to me quite plain that without soul there may be brain i give to beasts a sort of mind compared to ours a league behind some matter i would subtilize some matter hard to analyze some atoms essence lights extract fire subtlest of all things in fact the flames that out of wood arise enable us to form some thought of what the soul is silver lies involved in lead beast brains are wrought so that they think and judge no more they judge imperfectly to sure no ape could ever argue then above all beasts i'll place us men
for to us man a double treasure belongs that sense which in some measure to all things living here below the wise and foolish high and low is common and that holier spirit which men with seraphim inherit and oh this loftier soul can fly through all the wondrous realms of sky on smallest point can lie at ease and though commence shall never cease things strange but true in infancy the soul must dim and feeble be but ripening years its frame develop and then it bursts the gross envelop which still in fetters always binds in men and beasts the lower minds end of fable 185 fable 186 the cormorant and the fishes through all the country far and wide in pools and rivers incessantly diving a cormorant greedy his table supplied on their finny inhabitants so daintily thriving but at length there came a day when all his strength gave way and the cormorant having to fish for himself unskilled to use nets which we mortals employ the fish for our own selfish use to decoy began soon to starve with no crumb on the shelf what could he do now necessity mother who teaches us more than we learn when at school advised the poor bird to go down to a pool and addressing a crayfish to say to him brother go tell your friends a tale of coming sorrow your master drains this pool a week to-morrow the crayfish hurried off without delay and soon the pool was quivering with dismay much trouble much debate at length was sent a deputation to the cormorant most lordly webfoot are you sure the vent will be as you have stated if so grant your kind advice in this our present need the sly bird answered change your home with speed but how do that oh that shall be my care for one by one i'll take you to my home a most impenetrable secret lair where never foe of finny tribe has come a deep wide pool of nature's best in which your race may safely rest the fish believe this friendly speech and soon were born each after each down to a little shallow cribbed confined in which the greedy bird could choose them to his mind and there they learnt although too late to trust no bills insatiate but after all it don't much matter a cormorant's throat or human platter whether a wolf or man digest me doesn't seem really to molest me and whether one's eaten to-day or to-morrow should scarcely be any occasion for sorrow end of fable one eighty six this recording is in the public domain Fables 187 and 188 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Nima. Fable 187 The Husband, the Wife, and the Robber A husband, loving very tenderly, most tenderly his wife, was treated ill by her. Her coldness caused him misery. No look, no glance, no, not a friendly word not e'en a smile such as she gave her bird but cold looks frowns and peevish answers still he did not venus nor yet hymen curse nor blame his destiny and cruel lot yet daily grew the evil worse and worse although he loved her every hour the more it is so now and has been so of yore in fact he was a husband was he not one night as he lay moaning in his sleep a robber entered, and, struck dumb with fear, the fretful wife, too frightened e'en to weep, sprang to her husband's arms, and sheltered there. Defied all sorrow, trouble, danger near, as her heart softened, and burst forth the tear. Friend robber, said the husband, but for thee I had not known this boundless happiness. Take all I have, I give thee liberty, take house and all, to prove my gratitude. Thieves, with much modesty, are not endued. 
the robber took sufficient, I confess. From this I argue that fear is so strong, it conquers hatred, and love too sometimes, yet love has triumphed over passion's throng. Witness the lover who his house burnt down, so he might win hope's brightest laurel crown, by rescuing her, the lady he loved long, and so secure her heart. I like this story. It strikes my fancy very pleasantly. It is so Spanish in its tone, I glory, in love so chivalrous and meddlesome, and hold it grand, so will all times to come, t'was not by any means insanity. Fable 188 The Shepherd and the King Our lives are spoiled by demons twain, turn in, turn out, by each in season, by each with reckless force is slain, that which we mortals call our reason. And, if you ask their name and state, I'll name God love, the potentate, for one and for the other. I'll name ambition, love's half-brother, who not seldom love defeats and reigns within his choicest seats. All this I soon could prove, but now, that which I wish to tell is how a shepherd by a king was sent for, and what this royal deed was meant for. The tale belongs to distant ages, and not to those which fill these pages. A numerous flock that filled the plain, and brought the owner heaps of gain, through shepherd's care and industry, once met a sapient monarch's eye. Pleased with such skill and thrift, he said, Good shepherd, to rule men, thou art bred. Leave now thy sheep, come, follow me, accept my widest satrapy. And so our shepherd, who before had scarce had friend but hermit poor, and very seldom had in view aught but his sheep and wolf or two, was with the viceroy's sceptre graced, nor was he by this change misplaced, for nature had endowed his mind with funds of great good sense, and how to govern humankind he amply learned from thence. End of Fable 188 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 189 and 190 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Fable 189 The Two Men and the Treasure A man of cash and credit shorn, the devil only in his purse, resolved to hang himself one morn, since death by hunger might be worse. A king of death which pleases not those curious in their final taste, a rope and nail he quickly got, and fixed them to a wall in haste. The wall was weak and very old, with the man's weight it crumbling fell, when out there came a stream of gold, the treasure that he loved so well. He did not stay to count, but ran, pale penury no more he feared, when in the miser came, poor man, to find his wealth had disappeared. Gold gone, this court's my only wealth, he cried. Now I have lost all hope. And so straightway he hanged himself. How changed the fortunes of that rope. The miser saves his wealth for those who may be prudent, may be thieves. Into the grave perhaps it goes. Who knows the changes fortune weaves? For Lady Fortune mocks outright at human nature's dying pangs, and if by you or me made tight the rope, she laughs that someone hangs. Fable 190 The Shepherd and His Flock Alas, I see another one of my poor foolish flock is gone. The wolf, relentless day by day, makes still another sheep his prey. In vain I count them, oft and oft, ten times a hundred, they're so soft that they have let my bob be torn by wolfish jaws. Ah, me forlorn, my darling bob would follow me, in town or in the country, up and down, over all the world, with tread for tread, if I but showed a bit of bread. A furlong of my step he knew, and to my piping time kept true. Alas, poor bobby! When at last this funeral discourse had passed, 
and robin's fame was duly sounded the shepherd by his flock surrounded addressed them all ram lamb and sheep and said that if they'd only keep united never wolf would dare their woolly coated throats to tear the flock declared with solemn bleat they all their master's views would meet form ever one united band and chase sir wolf from out the land delighted at their brave reply guillot regaled them sumptuously but sad to say before the night there happened a disaster new a horrid wolf appeared in sight and off the timid creatures flew in truth twas a mere shadow but the ants a wolf in lilliput bad soldiers you in vain address heroic aims they all profess but let the slightest danger show in spite of generals off they go end of fable 190 this recording is in the public domain Fables 191 and 192 by Jean de la Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 191 The Kite and the Nightingale. A daring thief, a kite by name, spread dire alarm o'er hill and dale. Ain little children cried for shame when he pounced on a nightingale the bird of spring for life prayed well i'm fit for songs and not for eating oh hear my notes and i will tell my tale of tyreus still repeating tyreus is that good food then said the kite no no was the reply he was a mighty king who made his love to me with vow and sigh his cruel love was strong too strong Twas mad, twas criminal now, sire, let me transport you with my song, a song so sweet you must admire. Not having eaten all the day, the kite had other views of things. Thus what's the use of music, pray? I too can talk of mighty kings. When you take kings, or kings take you, sing to them and their pretty dears. I'm hungry and know what to do, an empty stomach has no ears end of fable 191 fable 192 the fish and the shepherd who played on the clarionet tursus for his loved annette played on the clarionet poured forth strains of music such as the very dead might touch played and sang beside a stream which through the meadows flowed like some delicious dream meanwhile annette demure and pretty with rod and line on fishes bent stood listening unto tursa's ditty which failed to lure them from their element still tursa sang come come ye fishes come come from the cool depths of your watery home forsake your naiad and see one more fair surrender all your lives to annette's care she is gentle she is kind in her keeping you will find your lives more safe than down below safe in a crystal pool no want you'll know and should you in her keeping die your fate i'd suffer willing lie now this song was well sung and the instrument strains were deliciously sweet but in spite of his pains the fishes avoided the charmer's keen hook then Tursus lost patience and hastily took a net called a trammel and sweeping the stream placed it at its disposal trout grayling and bream o shepherds of men and not of sheep kings who think you can safely keep your subjects in order by rule of right attend to my counsel and spread out your nets before the time comes for forlorn regrets and let them cringe under the rule of might End of Fable 192. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 193 and 194 by Jean de la Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 193 The Man and the Snake. 
a man once saw a snake and said thou wretched thing i'll strike thee dead tis for the general good and straight the wicked thing by wicked it be understood i mean not man but wretch with sting for some my meaning might mistake well this base and atrocious snake was placed in sack and doomed alack to death without the aid of jury but yet the man despite his fury to show that he with justice acted his reasons in these words compacted o symbol of all that is base twere a crime to spare one of thy race for mercy to those that are bad can from foolish ones only be had and no more shall thy sting or thy teeth o thou villainous snake find their sheath the serpent thus addressed his counter views expressed and briefly made reply o man if all must die who graceless are then there's none who would not be undone yourself shall be the judge i'll take from you excuse for me the snake my life is in your hands i know but ponder ere you strike the blow and see how what you justice call is based on vices great and small your pleasure and convenience you'll satisfy at my expense but pray think not that i am rude if dying i this statement make that man and not the snake the symbol is of all ingratitude these words the angry man surprise he starts aside and then replies your words are nonsense and to me belongs of right your fate's decree but nathless let us have resort unto some independent court the snake assented and a cow that stood hard by appealed to said the case is plain i can't see how the thing should puzzle any head the snake is right i'll frankly say for yonder man for many a day with milk and curd i've amply fed and long ere this his child were dead if my rich food his pining son had rescued not from acheron and now that i am old and dry he leaves me wanting grass to die sure had a serpent been my master it could have been no worse disaster thus saying with an awkward bow walked off or rather limped the cow the man aghast at this decree exclaimed o oh, snake it cannot be the cow is doting let us place before this ox our mutual case the snake assents and heavily eye the ox walks up and by and by still ruminating makes reply to this effect that after years of painful toil and weariness that ceres wealth man might possess and here the ox burst into tears his sole reward had been the goad when panting with some weighty load and what was worse his owner thought he ox was honoured being bought by cruel butcher to be flayed and as a prize beast then displayed the man declared the ox a liar and said yon oak tree shall be trier the tree appealed to made a case redounding unto man's disgrace told how he sheltered man from rain told how he garnished hill and plain told how he gave man flowers and fruits and how that when man's will it suits he cuts him down and burns his roots the man convinced against his will resolved to have his vengeance still so took the serpent bag and all and banged it up against the wall until the wretched serpent died and human wrath was satisfied it is ever thus with the rich and great truth and reason they always hate they think that all things here below solely for their convenience grow and if any this simple truth denies they call him sulky growler of lies and this being so when you wish to teach the truth to people keep out of their reach end of fable 193 fable 194 the tortoise and the two ducks a tortoise once with an empty head grown sick of her safe but monotonous home resolved on some distant shores to tread it is ever the cripple that loves to roam 
two ducks to whom our friend repaired to gossip o'er her bold intent their full approval straight declared and pointing to the firmament said by that road tis broad and ample we'll seek columbia's mighty range see people's laws and manners strange ulysses shall be our example ulysses would have been astounded at being with the scheme confounded the tortoise liking much this plan straightway the friendly ducks began to see how one for flight unfitted might through the realms of air be flitted at length within her jaws they fitted a trusty stick and seizing each an end with many a warning cry hold fast hold fast bore up to heaven their adventurous friend the people wondered as the cortege passed and truly it was droll to see a tortoise and her house in the duck's company a miracle the wandering mob surprises behold on clouds the great queen tortoise rises a queen the tortoise answered yes forsooth make no mistake i am in honest truth alas why did she speak she was a chattering dunce for as her jaws unclose the stick slips out at once and down amidst the gaping crowds she sank a wretched victim to her claims to rank self-pride a love of idle speaking and wish to be for ever seeking a power that nature ne'er intended our follies close allied and from one stock descended end of fable one ninety four this recording is in the public domain Fables 195 and 196 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Fable 195 The Two Adventurers and the Talisman. I have never heard or read in annals true or fabled story that paths of pleasure ever led mortal heroes unto glory and in proof of this one sees the labours twelfth of hercules however once by talisman induced a knight conceived the plan of mounting horse and couching lance and seeking lands of fair romance accompanied by one he knew after a time there came in view a post upon the public way on which was writ a moment stay adventurous knight if you would see that which no knight has seen before venture across yon torrent's roar and from the root of yonder tree yon elephant's huge head of stone raise up and without resting bear to yonder mountain's crest which proudly stands alone now of these knights one was of those who shudder at your swashing blows the torrent's deep and broad he cried and if we reach the other side we climb unto a mountain's crest with a stone elephant oppressed tis true the artist may have wrought his work on such a scale a man might bear it for a yard then rest but tell me not that mortal can bear it to yonder mountain's top not daring once for breath to stay perhaps this mystic head is naught but such as one might bear away and if the latter be the truth success were honour small in sooth the whole thing is so plain a trick i'll leave it come my friend be quick this wise man having passed along the other crossed his breast and made a dash across the torrent strong and found beneath the tree the beast's head laid he raised it and with breathless stride he bore it to the mountain's brow and there upon a terrace wide gazed on a city fair that stretched below Oomph cried the elephant and then forth swarmed the host of armed men all other errant knights but this would now have shown some cowardice but he so far from turning back couched lance in rest and spurred to the attack but what the hero's great surprise when all the crowd with joyful cries proclaimed him monarch in the place of one just dead with modest grace the knight declared he was not fit a crown to wear and then took it sixtus the pope once said so too and is it then so bad a thing to be a pope or be a king but sixtus said what was not true 
Blind fortune to blind courage is a friend, and often he will gain his end who rashly acts, whilst he who tarries, by prudence quite deceived, miscarries. Fable 196 The Miser and His Friend A miser once, who'd got much money, was puzzled how to hide that honey, for ignorance and love of gain, being ever sisters twain, had left him at a total loss where to secrete his golden dross. And why the miser was so hot to find a place of safety for his hoarded pelf was simply the great fear that filled his mind that some day he should spend and rob himself. Yes, rob himself by gathering pleasure from the usage of his treasure. Poor miser, how I pity your mistake. Wealth is not wealth unless we use it and when we do not, we abuse it. Why keep money till the sense of pleasure dies in impotence? To gather gold alone is wretched slaving. To have to watch it makes it not worth having. However this may be, our miser might have found some trusty banker for his gold, but it seemed better, to his purblind sight, to give it to the depth of earth to hold. So with a comrade's aid, it soon beneath the turf was laid. But when a little time was past, our miser, going to revisit his buried treasure, found a huge deficit. At first despair oppressed him, but at last he hurried to his comrade, and he said, Tomorrow I shall want your help again. Some bags of gold still in my house remain, and they had better with the rest be laid. The comrade immediately hurried away and returned all the gold he had taken, intending to grasp the whole lot the next day. But in this he was somewhat mistaken. For the miser, grown wise by the loss of his store, resolved neath the earth to conceal it no more, but to use and enjoy it, and thus the poor thief, by being too clever, came headlong to grief. In my belief, there is no ill in playing the rascal to a villain. End of Fable 196. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 197 and 198 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 197, The Wolf and the Peasants A conscientious wolf one day, if conscientious wolves there be, lamenting he was beast of prey, though such but by necessity, exclaimed I dreaded far and near to all a thing of hate and fear, dogs, hunters, and peasants combined to pursue me, and weary out Jove with their prayers to undo me. In England long since a price paid for my head, has caused the whole race to be utterly dead. I'm an object of wrath to each ignorant squire, who orders his people to hunt me and kill, and if a child cries all that mothers require, is to mention my name to make it be still. And why this universal spite in all the country round, which never leaves the wolf at rest, because perchance by hunger pressed, to satisfy my appetite, I've eaten scurvy sheep or ass or mangy hound. Ah, well, henceforth I'll eat no living thing, but feed on herbs and water from the spring, or starve and die a cruel, cruel fate, sooner than be a thing of universal hate. Saying these words, a pleasant savour drew our wolf's attention to some shepherds near, feasting on what his wolfish instinct knew had once been lambkin to some mother dear. Ah, ah, he exclaimed, this is strange by my troth. I'm reproaching myself for each lamb that I've slain, whilst the shepherds and sheepdogs themselves are not loth. To regale on roast lamb is abundantly plain. And shall I, then, a wolf, feed on nothing but grass? No, not if I know it, the day shall not pass till a lambkin has gone down my cavernous jaws without waiting for any of cookery's laws. A lamb, did I say? I should just think so rather. I, the mother that bore him, and also his father. 
Well, the wolf was right, for as long as we feed on animals' flesh, it is surely unjust that we should endeavor to make them recede to the primitive food of a root or a crust. And beasts of prey we should always remember, know not the use of spit or ember. Shepherds, shepherds, trust to me, the wolf a hermit ne'er can be. And sure the wolf is only wrong when he is weak and you are strong. End of Fable 197 Fable 198 The Rabbits To the Duke de Rochefoucauld I have often said on seeing how men like animals seem to act, that the lord of the earth, a poor frail being, is not much better, in fact, than the beasts whom he rules and that nature has given to each living creature a sense of morality's force that its origin owes to the one same source at that witching hour when day in the brown of the eve melts away or at that when the long brooding night has just lifted its pinions for flight i climb up some tree at the edge of a wood and there like a jove so wise and so good i startle with fear some young rabbit scambolling near then the nation of rabbits, which in tune with its habits, with eyes and ears both open wide, played and browsed on the woodland side, perfuming its banquets with odors of thyme, with a hurry and scurry, tails turned in a hurry, seeks its earth-sheltered burrows, thieves flying from crime. But five minutes or so have not vanished when, lo, more gay than before on the fragrant green floor, a rollicking band, the rabbits are there again under my hand. Ah, we do not in this perceive a picture of the race of men, who shipwrecked once will still again the safety of the harbor leave, risking fresh shipwreck from the selfsame wind? True rabbits! they to fortune blind and trust their wealth and all their store and of this truth take one example more when stranger dogs pass through some place where they do not of want reside the native dogs at once give chase with hungry jaws all opening wide fearing that the intruders may snatch the true owner's food away and never weary till the intruders are safely driven from their borders just so with those whom gracious fates have made the governors of states and those whom many artful plans have made much favored courtesans and merchants men of any kind in all you'll find this jealous mind each one in his several place to the intruder grants no grace your fine coquettes and authors are precisely of this character woe to the unknown writer who dares publish something bright and new poets forgive you any crime if you'll not rival them in rhyme a thousand instances of this i might recite but well i wish that works should never be too long moreover you should always show you think your readers wise you know so now i'll close this song ah you to whom i owe so much whose greatness and whose modesty are inexact equality who cannot bear that men should touch with praiseful tongues your well-earned fame who still will blush with needless shame you who scarcely have allowed that i should make my verses proud and from critics and from time protect my insufficient rhyme by heading them with one of those great names which make our nation's pride our france whose annals long disclose more famous names than all the world beside oh let me tell the universe that you gave me this subject for my verse End of Fable 198. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 199 and 200 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 199. The Swallow and the Spider. O Jupiter, who from thy regal brow drew forth Minerva, my old enemy, list to the prayer of a poor spider now, 
listen i pray to thee progna here and there all day and everywhere ever skimming flitting fifty times a day passes by me sitting in my trimly woven lair passes by me impudent and bears away my prey yes swallows up the flies that are crowding to my net which with skilful patience tween the laurel boughs i've set thus the spider who of yore so artistically wove but now reduced in rank to the state of humble spinner regarding every fly as hers of right for dinner complained in noisy accents unto all deciding jove but in spite of this harangue still philomel's swift sister sprang past the luckless spider's door ever with her mane and might and with pitiless delight bearing to her brood incessantly the food which the clamorous little gluttons demanded more and more but sad it is to tell still worse was yet to comb for the swallow skimming flitting spied the spider sadly sitting and snatched her hanging helpless from her once well-ordered home in this world here below it is jupiter's plan two tables to spread for two different classes at the one feast the skilful strong vigilant man at t'other star feeble and ignorant masses end of fable one ninety nine Fable 200. The Partridge and the Fowls. Once to a red-legged partridge it befell, amongst a lot of fighting cocks to dwell. Now as the latter are a gallant race, fighting with pleasure for a dame's embrace, the partridge hoped that she would treated be by these brave birds with hospitality. But soon, alas, her hopes were crossed for oft by angry passions tossed her fiery hosts with spur and beak would tear her plumage brown and sleek at first this grieved partridge much but when as soon she did she saw her foes inflicting on each other equal woes she ceased to blame them for said she they're such as jupiter has made them and we know that he has planted many various creatures here below the partridge mild the gamecock rude and wild if i could be as i would be i'd pass my life in gentle company but what avails these vain regrets the master here takes partridges and nets and forces them to live with fowls we owe to man and not to nature all our woe end of fable two hundred this recording is in the public domain Fables 201 and 202 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Lion Through spoil and plunder, wealthy grown, a leopard once claimed as his own in meadows broad and forests deep, full many a steer and stag and sheep. At length, upon some luckless morn, not far away, a lion born, received as usual is with great ones the compliments well known as state ones but this once done king leopard said to mr fox his vizier keen i know you suffer from the spleen because this lion whelp is bred but why be fearful since his father is in death's keeping pity rather this orphan child disconsolate for he will have a lucky fate if he instead of seeking strife can but contrive to save his life the fox replied for orphans such my pity is not overmuch in fact two things alone remain his friendship by some means to gain or else to kill him ere he grows too strong for all the world to pose his horoscope i've duly cast and find that he will ever be to us the bitterest enemy but to allies he will cling fast so now decide become his friend or straight away of him make an end but argued thus the fox in vain the leopard slept with all his train until the lion's whelp full grown spread havoc and made all his own then mr fox with careworn brow appealed to said tis useless now to think of meeting force by force suppose to friends you had recourse 
they would but eat up all your store, and Master Lion does no more. But, sire, remember that the lion has got three friends he can rely on, who ask for neither pay nor food, strength, vigilance, and fortitude. So send him now a sheep or two, and if that won't answer, lambs a few, and if he's not content with that, a heifer add, both large and fat. For by this means, perchance you may save something from this beast of prey. Thus spoke the fox, but to his master the advice seemed ill, and thence disaster spread over all the country round. For still, combine as might the states, republic cities, potentates, they still the lion master found. If you would now the moral know, just to this brief advice attend. If you have let a lion grow, take care that he becomes your friend. The Dog Whose Ears Were Cut What have I done, I should like to know, that my master should make me a public show? Amongst other dogs I can never now go. Oh, kings of animals, human race, tyrants, authors of my disgrace, I wish some demon would treat you the same. Thus a young dog reflected, mad with pain, as they cropped his long ears, but his cries were in vain, and he thought himself lost, but he found, one fine day, that his loss was a gain, for by nature endowed with a combative spirit, in many a fray, he saw that to cropping his long ears he owed avoidance of many a subject for tears. Rough dogs, when they fight, bite their enemies' ears. For hostile mastiffs his were best of all, tis easy to defend one opening in a wall, armed with a collar and with ears but small, our young dog meets his foes, fights, and defeats them all. End of Fable 202 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 203 and 204 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry, read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Two Parrots, the Monarch, and His Son A parrot and his child, tis said, on royal dishes daily fed, having the affections one of a monarch and his son. An equal age made either pair affection for each other bear. The fathers gravely loved each other, and their chicks, though wild and young, at school or play together clung. As fondest brother unto brother, that a paroquet thus by the son of a king should be loved, need we say, was a wonderful thing. Now the fates had endowed this young heir to the throne with a love for all creatures that he called his own, and a sparrow, by arts which caused prudes to despise her, had contrived how to make this great monarch's son prize her. And so it chanced, alack, one day, that the rivals twain at play fell into a desperate rage, and the youthful parrot stung by some taunt the sparrow flung, attacked and sent her dying to her cage. And then the prince with equal fury seized, the slayer snatched and in a death grip squeezed. Soon to the parrot father's ears, the tidings came and then the heir was tortured by his wild despair but not availed or moans or tears for his child was lying still inanimate with voiceless bill then from his woe the bird awoke and with a cruel double stroke tore out the wretched prince's eyes this done unto a pine he flies and on its topmost branch he knows what joy from satiate vengeance flows runs then the king to him and cries come down my friend our tears are vain in love let's bury woe and hate this wretchedness tis very plain comes from my son or rather fate had long since writ her stern decree your son should die and mine not see and that we parents twain should live disconsolate on this the father bird replied too great a wrong us twain divide nor can I think he'll smother hate, who heathenishly speaks of fate. But whether it be providence or fate that rules our lives, I'm sure that I will never move from hence till tempted by some wood secure. 
i know that in a kingly breast vengeance for a time may rest but kings are also like the gods and soon or late you feel their rods i can scarcely trust you far though sincere you think you are but you are losing time below for with my will i'll never go and trust me hate like love is best by absence lullabied to rest fable two hundred four the peasant of the danube to judge by appearances only is wrong the maxim is true if not very new and by means of a mouse i have taught it in song but to prove it at present i'll change my note and with aesop and socrates also i'll quote a boar whom marcus aurelius drew and left us a portrait both faithful and true the first are old friends but the other unknown is sufficiently well in this miniature shown his chin was clothed with a mighty beard and all his body so thickly furred that much he resembled a grizzly bear one that had never known mother's care neath eyebrows shaggy two piercing eyes glared in a way more fierce than wise whilst ill-shaped lips and a crooked nose the sum of his facial beauties close a girdle of goatskin formed his dress with small shells studded for comeliness the sturdy youth at a time when rome spoiled many a race of its native home was sent as a sort of deputation by danubian towns to the roman nation arriving after toilsome travels the rustic thus his tale unravels o romans and you reverend sires who sit to list to my desires first let me pray the gods that they may teach me what i ought to say and so direct my ignorant tongue that it may utter nothing wrong without their intervention must be all things evil all unjust unless through them we plead our cause tis sure we violate their laws in witness of this truth perceive how roman avarice makes us grieve for tis not by its arms that rome has robbed us both of peace and home tis we ourselves ill ways pursuing have worked at length our own undoing then romans fear that heaven in time to you may send the wage of crime and justice in our vengeful hands placing its destructive brands hurl swift o'er you the endless waves of war and make you fettered slaves why why should we be slaves to you what isn't that you can better do than the poor tribes you scourge with war why trouble lives that tranquil are before you came we fed in peace our flocks and reaped our fields increase what to the germans have you taught courageous they and quick of thought had avarice been their only aim they might have played a different game and now have held the world in chains but ah believe me they would not have scourged your race with needless pains had victory been now their lot the cruelties by your prefects wrought can scarce be ever borne in thought us e'en your roman altars scare for your god's eyes are everywhere the gods alas tis thanks to you that naught but horror meets their view that they themselves are scoffed and jeered at and all but avarice is sneered at of all the cruel men you sent to rule our towns not one's content they seize our lands they make us toil and even our little huts they spoil o oh, call them back our boars refuse to till the fields for others use we quit our homes and to the mountains fly no tender wife now bears us company with wolves and bears we pass our lives away for who would children rear for rome to slay and oh the terrors of your prefect spring when added horror for a hateful thing unknown before has now spread far and wide throughout our native land infanticide call back your men or else the german race from day to day in vice will grow apace but why should i come here to make appeal the self-same vices spoil your commonweal at rome as on the danube's banks the way to gain a scrap of justice is to pay i know my words are rude and only wait humbly to suffer candor's usual fate the half-wild peasant paused and all astonished that such words could fall from lips uncouth and that such sense 
large-heartedness and eloquence could dwell within a savage man proclaimed him a patrician the danube's prefects were recalled and others in their place installed and more than this the senate made a copy of the peasant's speech all future orators to teach how to tell truth convince persuade but sad to tell not long at rome had eloquence like this its home end of fable two hundred four this recording is in the public domain fables two hundred five and two hundred six by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornberry read for librivox dot org by betty b the lioness and she bear a mother lion had lost her young a hunter had stolen her cub away and from the dawn when the gay birds sung all through the shadeless hours of day she filled the forest with huge dismay nor did the night with its silent charms still the voice of this childless mother's alarms at length a she-bear rose and said do you ever think of the children dead by your paws and jaws so cruelly slain yet their mother's silence still remain and why not you the beast replied my child is lost perhaps has died and nothing for me now is left but a life of hope bereft and what condemns you to this wretched fate fate echoed then the beast disconsolate from since the time the world a world became all living things have thought or said the same you wretched mortals who bewail that over you fate's darkest cloud is thrown just think of hecuba's sad tale then thank the gods that it is not your own fable two hundred six the merchant the nobleman the shepherd and the king's son a merchant shepherd lord and a king's son adventuring to a distant land by waves and shipwrecks utterly undone found themselves beggars on a foreign strand it matters not to tell at large what chance had joined them in an equal fate but one day sitting on a fountain's marge they counsel took disconsolate the prince confessed with many a bitter sigh the ills that fall on those who sit on high the shepherd thought it best to throw all thoughts of former ills afar laments he said no medicines are so let us use the arts we know and work and earn the means to take us back to rome but what is this can prudent language come from shepherd's mouth and is it not then true that they alone are wise whose blood is blue surely sheep and shepherd are as far as thought goes on a par however wrecked on shores american without a choice the three approved this plan the merchant cried that they should keep a school himself arithmetic would teach by rule for monthly pay and i the prince exclaimed will teach how proper laws for states are framed the noble said and i intend to try for pupils in the art of heraldry as though such wretched stuff could have a home beyond the atlantic wave then cried the shepherd worth all praise are your intentions but remark the week has many days now where a meal to seek i am somewhat in the dark your prospects of success are good but i am pining now for food tell me therefore comrades pray whence comes to-morrow's meal and whence the meal to-day you seem in your resources rich but food to-day is a subject which so presses that i really must decline to put in you my trust this said the shepherd in a neighboring wood collected faggots which he sold for food and shared it kindly with his clever friends before their talents had attained their ends or by long fasting they were forced to go and air their talents in the world below from this adventure we i think may learn that for life's daily needs much learning is not wanted but that to every man the power to earn food by his labor had been freely granted end of fable two hundred six this recording is in the public domain fables two hundred seven and two hundred eight by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornbury 
Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Old Man and the Three Young Men. An old man planting a tree was met by three joyous youths of the village near, who cried, It is dotage a tree to set at your years, sir, for it will not bear, unless you reach Methuselah's age. To build a tomb were much more sage. But why, in any case, burden your days with care for other people's enjoyment? Tis for you to repent of your evil ways. To care for the future is our employment. Then the aged man replies, All slowly grows, but quickly dies. It matters not if then or now you die or I. We all must bow soon, soon, before the destinies. And tell me which of you, I pray, is sure to see another day, or whether e'en the youngest shall survive this moment's interval. My great-grandchildren, ages hence, shall bless this tree's benevolence. And if you seek to make it plain that pleasing others is no gain, I, for my part, truly say I taste this tree's ripe fruit to-day, and hope to do so often yet. Nor should I be surprised to see, though truly with sincere regret, the sunrise gild your tombstones three. These words were stern but bitter truths, for one of these adventurous youths, intent to seek a distant land, was drowned just as he left the strand. The second, filled with martial zeal, bore weapons for the commonweal, and in a battle met the lot of falling by a random shot. The third one from a treetop fell and broke his neck. The old sage then, weeping for the three young men, upon their tomb wrote what I tell. The Gods as Instructors of Jupiter's Son Jupiter, youthful, once upon a time, thought it no crime to bring up his son as the mortal ones do and straightway this godlike one given to jollity love's sweet frivolity thought it no harm maiden's favor to sue for in him love and reason skipping over a season long ere the usual time taught him to woo flora was first to set his poor young heart in fret and with sighs and tears tender, forgetting no lover's trick, this roguish young hero quick made her surrender. And shortly it was evident that, thanks to his supreme descent, the other god-born children were surpassed by Jupiter's young heir. But Jupiter, rather dissatisfied in his pride, assembling his council one thunderous day, said, I've hitherto ruled all this universe wide alone, but I feel now the weight of my sway, and would fain to my child give some power away. He's blood of my blood, and already afar his altars are worshipped in many a star, but before I entrust him with sovereign place, I should like him to grow, both in knowledge and grace. Thus the god of thunder spoke, and then, with one acclaim sonorous, a shout of praise in tuneful chorus, the echoes deep of heaven awoke. When silence was at length restored, Mars, god of war, took up the word, and said, I will myself impart to this young prodigy the art through which this realm so vast has grown, and those who mortal were are now as godlike known. Then Apollo tunefully murmured, He shall learn from me all that sweet and mystic lies in music's deepest harmonies. Next, Hercules, with eyes of flame, exclaimed, I'll teach him how to tame the monsters that invade the breast, the vain temptations that infest the heart's recesses. Yes, I'll teach your offspring how with toil to reach heights and honors that alone are to steadfast virtue known. When all had spoken, with an air of scorn, smiled in reply the child of Venus born. Leave, he said, the boy alone to me, and all that he can be, he'll be. And, speaking thus, well spoke, God Cupid, for there's not on earth more plain that he is not wholly stupid, 
who, loving well, does all things gain. End of Fable 208 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 209 and 210 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. The Owl and the Mice Whene'er you have a tale to tell, ne'er call it marvellous yourself, if you would have it go down well. For if you do, some spiteful elf will scorn it. But for once I'll vow the tale that I shall tell you now is marvellous and though like fable may be received as veritable so old a forest pine had grown at last twas marked to be cut down within its branches dark retreat an owl had made its gloomy seat the bird that atropos thought meet its cry of vengeance to repeat deep in this pine tree's stem time worn with other living things forlorn lived swarms of mice who had no toes but never mice were fat as those. For Master Owl, who'd snipped and torn, day after day, fed them on corn. The wise bird reasoned thus, I've oft caught and stored mice within my croft, which ran away, and scaped my claws. One remedy is, I'll cut their paws, and eat them slowly at my ease. Now one of those, now one of these. To eat them all at once were blameful, and my digestion is so shameful. You see, the owl was, in his way, as wise as we. So, day by day, his mice had fit and due provision. Yet, after this, some rash Cartesian is obstinate enough to swear that owls but mechanism are. But how, then, could this night bird find this craftily contrived device, the nibbling of paws of mice, were he not furnished with a mind. See how he argued craftily. Whene'er I catch these mice, they flee. And so the only way to save them is at one huge meal to brave them. But that I cannot do. Besides, the wise men for bad days provides. But how to keep them within reach? Why, neatly bite the paws from each. Now, could their gentle reader mine be human reasoning more fine? Could Aristotle's self have wrought a closer chain of argued thought? The Companions of Ulysses O Prince, to whom the immortals give their care and power and grace, permit, my verse may on your shrine still live, by burning there, though void of wit. I know tis late, but let my muse plead years and duns for her excuse. My soul is faint, and not like yours, which as an eagle proudly soars. The hero from whose veins you drew this brilliant soul is e'en like you in martial fields. Tis not his fault his steps at victory's archway halt. Some god retains him, the same king who once the Rhine with victory's wing swept over in one month, they say. Then speed was right, but now delay. But I must pause, though loves and smiles detest the verse that runs to miles, and of the loves and smiles your court is, all men know, the chief resort. But other gods its precincts grace, good sense and reason there have place, and I must beg that you will seek of these a story from the Greek of certain men who, yielding up, their souls to folly's poison cup, from men to beasts were quickly changed, and in brute forms the forest ranged. After ten years of war and pain, Ulysses' comrades tempt the main. Long tossed about by every wind, at length an island shore they find, where Circe, great Apollo's child, held sway, and on the strangers smiled. She gave them cups of drink delicious, with poison sweet, with drugs pernicious. Their reason first gave way, and then they lost the forms and souls of men. Ranging about in shapes of beast, some like the largest, some the least, 
the lion, elephant, and bear, the wolf, and e'en the mole were there. Ulysses, he alone escaped, refusing Circe's cup to drain, and as his form was finely shaped, and godlike wisdom graced his mind, the goddess sought his soul to gain by poison draughts of varied kind. In fact, like any turtle dove, the goddess cooed and told her love. Ulysses was too circumspect such coin of vantage to neglect, and begged that all his comrades should resume their manhood's natural mould. Yes, said the nymph, it shall be so. If they desire, you ask them, go. Ulysses ran, and calling round his former comrades, said, I found a method sure by which again you may resume the forms of men, and as a token that tis true, this instant speech returns to you. Then roared the lion, I'm no fool, your offer really is too cool. What, throw away my claws and teeth, with which I tear my foes to death? No, now I'm king. In Grecian land I should a private soldier stand. You're very kind, but let me rest. I choose to be a regal beast. Much with this rough-roared speech distressed, Ulysses next the bear addressed, and said, My brother, what a sight are you who once were trim and slight? The bear replied in accents gruff, I'm like a bear, that's quite enough. Who shall decide, I'd like to know, sir, that one forms fine, another grosser? Who made of man the judge of bears? With fair dames now I've love affairs. You do not like my shape? Tis well. Pass on, content and free I dwell, Within these woods, and flatly say, I scorn mankind, and here shall stay. The prince the wolf accosted then, And lest refusal came again, said, Comrade, I'm in deep distress, For there's a lovely shepherdess Who echo wearies out with cries Against your wolfish gluttonies. In former days your task had been her sheep from every wolf to screen. You led an honest life, oh, come, and once more manhood's form resume. No, no, replied the wolf, I'll stay. A ravenous wolf you call me, pray. If I the sheep had eaten not, would they have scaped your spit and pot? If I were man, should I be less a foe unto the shepherdess? For just a word or slight mistake, you men each other's heads will break. And are you not then wolfish too? I have weighed the case, and hold it true, that wolves are better far than man. I'll be a wolf then, whilst I can. To all in turn Ulysses went, and used this selfsame argument. But all, both great and small, refused to be of beast life disabused. To range the woods, to feed and love, To them seemed all things else above. Let others reap the praise, they cried, Of noble deeds, we're satisfied. And so, fast bound in pleasure's chains, They thought that free they roamed the plains. O oh, prince, I much had wished to choose A tale which might teach and amuse. The scheme itself was not so bad, But where could such a tale be had? I pondered long, at length the fate of Circe's victims struck my pate. Such victims in this world below were always, and are even now. To punish them I will not strike, but hold them up to your dislike. End of Fable 210 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 211 and 212 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 211 The Farmer, the Dog, and the Fox. The wolf and the fox are neighbors strange, and within their reach I'd not build my grange. One of the latter had long espied the fowls of a farmer. But though he tried, each art of his cunning, the hens were still, safe from the jaws of the midnight ranger. Perplexed as he was twixt his hungry will, 
and the wholesome dread of impending danger. Alas, he cried, it is fine forsooth, that wretches like these should mock me. I come and I go, and I wet my tooth, and with brilliant schemes I stock me. And all this time that horrible lout, the farmer makes money week in, week out, of chicken and capon, or roasts or boils, whilst I who surpass him in wit and sense would be glad if I could but carry from hence the toughest old hen as reward for my toils. By the gods above and the gods below, omnipotent Jove, I should like to know. And I will know, too, why you made me a fox, to suffer such troubles and impudent mocks. So breathing his vengeance, Sir Sly Fox chose, a night when the world was bathed in repose, when the farmer, his servants, and even his dogs, cocks, chickens, and hens, slept as sound as logs. Now the farmer himself, with a folly extreme, had left the door open ere he went to dream, and the consequence was that the fox entered in it, and its feathered inhabitants slew in a minute. When the morrow's newborn sun, all the slaughter that was done, struck the eye with huge dismay, and almost made the sun avert his rising ray. T'was a parallel, in fact, with Apollo's direful act, when with Atreus' son enraged, with the Greeks such war he waged, the great hillocks of the slain lay heaped high upon the plain. Not unlike the ghastly scene, when great Ajax, filled with spleen, flocks of sheep and herds of oxen madly slew, dreaming that he smote the crew, who with famed Ulysses wise had deprived him of his prize. Then the fox, whom none could parry, having seized on what he might, thought it quite unwise to tarry, and discreetly took to flight. Now when the master rose, be sure, against his men and dogs, he swore, for tis a common trick of masters, others to blame for their disasters. O oh, wretched dog, he shouted forth, O oh, dog for drowning only worth, why barked you not to let us know? Master, the dog replied, I trow, master and farmer, tis not fair, that I your anger now should share. The fowls are yours, and yours the gain, then why should I, sir, suffer the pain? Because you leave your fowls exposed to any thief that way disposed. Such reasoning we must all admit, for a mere dog was fraught with wit. But on the other hand, tis sure that masters can't such wit endure, as Carlo found when soundly whipped, for words of sense unwisely slipped. Now, fathers all, whoe'er you be, I aim not at that high degree. When you would sleep, trust none of those around you but your own doors close. He who would have a thing well done should trust unto himself alone. End of Fable 211 Fable 212 The Dream of an Inhabitant of Mogul Once on a time, in slumber wrapped, a certain peasant had a vision of a great vizier calmly lapped in endless joys of fields Elysian. Then straight away, in a moment's space, the dreamer sees another place wherein a hermit bathed in fire endures such torments as inspire even those who share his fate with sympathy compassionate unusual this indeed so curious it seems as though the dreams were spurious and to the dreamer so surprising that straight he woke and fell surmising his dreams were ill as some of her but soon a wise interpreter consulted said be not perplexed for if to me some skill is given to understand a secret text, these dreams are messages from heaven, and mean on earth whene'er he could, the vizier sought sweet solitude, whereas the hermit day by day to courts of viziers made his way. Now if to this I dare to add, I'd praise the pleasures to be had, deep in the bosom of retreat, pleasures heavenly pure and sweet. 
O solitude, I know your charms, O night, I ever in your breast, Far, far from all the world's alarms, By balmy air would still be blessed. Oh, who will bear me to your shades? When shall the nine, the heavenly maids, Far from cities, far from towns, Far from human smiles and frowns, Wholly employ my tranquil hours, And teach me how the mystic powers, Aloft unseen by human eyes, Mysterious hold their mighty sway, And how the planets, night and day, Fashion and rule our destinies. But if for such pursuits as these I am not born at least among, The groves I'll wander and in song Describe the woods, the streams, the trees. No golden threads shall weave my fate, Neath no rich silk I'll lie in state, And surely yet my eyes shall close In no less deep and sweet repose. To solitude fresh vows I'll pay, And when at length the fatal day Shall place me in the arms of death, as calm I've lived, so calm I'll yield my breath. End of Fable 212 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 213 and 214 by Jean de la Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornberry And read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona Fable 213 the two goats. Since goats have ever clambering browsed, by nature's gentle force aroused, they've wandered far and wandered free, enjoying sweets of liberty. Their greatest pleasure is to find paths all known to humankind. A rock or hanging precipice suits these wild animals' caprice. No wall can make their gambols cease. Two white-footed goats then thus inspired, and with adventurous spirit fired, deserted pastures too well known, and chose their routes, each one his own. But though each separate pathways took, if chance they reached the selfsame brook, or which for bridge a plank was thrown, that scarce would have sufficed for own. The stream was deep, the flood was wide, and should these dames have terrified. But spite of danger, each young lady advanced upon the plank unsteady. And now, by aid of history, Louis le Grand I seem to see. Philip the Fourth advanced to meet upon the Isle of Conference. Well, step by step, with agile feet, our ramblers with a proper sense of what was due to ancestry refused to yield for one goat she could claim that polyphemus laid her sire at galatia's feet the other just as boldly said her dam was amalthea sweet the goat who gave her milk to jove who rules below and reigns above neither would yield so both fell down and there we leave our goats to drown of moral i've not much to say but such things happen Every day. End of Fable 213. Fable 214. The Lion, the Ape, and the Two Asses. A young king lion, desirous to shape, by moralty's laws his government, on one fine morning prudently sent for that clever old master of arts, the ape. And the statesman consulted sagely replied, O king, hold this maxim as your very best guide. Let your own self-will to the good of the state be in all cases subordinate. For tis simply neglect of this wholesome rule that so oft makes us animals play the fool. It is not in one day, or even in two, that this evil self-love you'll contrive to subdue. But should you succeed, O my monarch august, you will never be foolish, and seldom unjust. Give me examples, replied the king, of both the one and the other thing. Each species has its vanity, the ape said very seriously. As, for instance, my own for the lawyer's call, all but themselves mean base and small. But on the other hand, self-esteem leads us to laud our deeds to the sky, as by doing this we fondly deem that our own position is raised as high. And now I deduce from what i have said that much so-called talent is merely grimace a trick which as wise men know has led many an idiot to power and place whilst following close 
But the other day, the steps of two asses, who foolishly fed each other with flattery, I heard the one to the other say, Is it not, sir, a shame and disgrace, that the tribe of mankind, that perfect race, should profane our dignified name by denoting as asses all those that are stupid or doting? And even has ventured such lengths as to say, that when mortals speak nonsense they utter a bray tis pleasant forsooth to perceive how mankind dream they're above us and yet are so blind no no let their orators silent remain for they are the brayers and fools and grain but with man let us cease one another to bother tis enough that we quite comprehend one another i will only here add that you have but to speak to make lark seem hoarse and the blackbird to squeak these qualities sir then the other replied in yourself in the fullest perfection reside and having thus spattered each other with praise they trot far and wide to repeat the same craze each fondly in hope like a couple of crows that a caw shall come back for the caw he bestows but this trait is not asinine only i own for I myself many great people have known, who would gladly, instead of my lording each other, have said to each other, my imperial brother. But I've spoken too long, and will only request that this secret be hid in your majesty's breast, since your majesty wished me some trait to divulge, which would show him how those in self-love indulge. Become objects of scorn, it would take me too long, to show all so now how it leads to worse wrong thus spoke the monkey false by nature but it has still in doubt remained if he the other point explained your monkey is a knowing creature and knows it is not fortunate to be too truthful with the great end of fable 214 this recording is in the public domain Fables 215 and 216 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 215, The Wolf and the Fox Why to the fox does Aesop ever give the palm of being clever? I the reason oft have sought without the reason finding aught when the wolf's engaged in strife to save his own or take a life the fox can do no more than he or half as much and so i might with master aesop disagree but there's a case has come to light in which tis fair i should admit the fox displayed the greater wit on one fine night it so befell that Reynard, looking down a well, the moon's full silver circle sees, and takes it for a lordly cheese. Two pails above the well suspended, to draw the water were intended, and into that which higher hung, good master Reynard famished sprung. Down swift he went, and to his woe found out his sad mistake below. He saw his death before his eyes, for he could never hope to rise, unless some other famished thing enticed by Dion's silver face into the other pale should spring, and then by sinking take his place. Two days passed on without a visit from any creature, and meanwhile old time had made a huge deficit in Mistress Moon's well-rounded smile. But just as all seemed lost at last, a hungry wolf the well's mouth passed, to whom the fox with joyous hail cried, Mr. Wolf, with me it regale. This glorious cheese you here behold, from Fauna's hands received its mould, of milk which heifer low gave. If Jupiter were lying ill, I think the god himself would crave of this delicious cheese to have his fill. I've eaten my share, as you plainly may see, but enough still remains both for you and for me. So enter that pail placed expressly for you. Now whether this story was told well or not, the wolf, like a fool, took it all in as true, and into the bucket with eagerness got. When outweighed, of course, Master Reynard got up, and the other remained on the moonshine to sup. And yet why blame the luckless beast? For tempted by some phantom feast, As easily deceived, 
that which he hopes or that he fears and either of the hemispheres is by each man believed end of fable 215 fable 216 the six stag in a land where stags abounded one fell very sick indeed and he saw his bed surrounded by a dozen friends in need gentlemen he muttered leave me leave me i implore to fate since your tears can only grieve me and your solace comes too late not a bit their lamentations lasted for a week or more while they took their daily rations from his very scanty store bit by bit his food diminished under such attacks as these till the sufferer's course was finished by starvation not disease for comforters of every kind some fee is necessary mind and nobody will give advice or shed a tear without his price end of fable 216 this recording is in the public domain fables 217 and 218 by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornbury read for LibriVox.org by sonia fable 217 the cat and the two sparrows to the duke of burgundy of equal age lived close together a sparrow and a cat and he of fur and he of feather grew so familiar that the bird could fearlessly provoke his formidable friend in joke to peck out eyes the one with beak pretended the other with protruded claws defended the cat however truth to say was always gentle in his play and though he showed his claws to care his little chirping friend to spare the fretful sparrow much less meek his tiny fury tried to wreak on master cat who only purred and thence this truth may be inferred that friends should never in dissension let quarrel grow to strife's dimension still old acquaintance never forgot kept their strifes from growing hot and battle never sprang from play but yet it chanced one luckless day a neighbouring sparrow heedless flew to where miss chirp and master mew had lived so long in amity at first twas well but by and by the birds grew jealous and in rage gave vent to wrath none could assuage the cat aroused from hearthrug sleep endeavoured first the peace to keep but finding that in vain declared what let this stranger sparrow come to eat my friend in his own home it shall not be his claws he bared and soon without a spoon or fork of master chirp made but short work the sparrow eaten said the cat a most delicious morsel that and as no other bird was near next swallowed his companion dear from this what moral shall i learn without a moral fables are but empty phantoms deserts bare some glimpse of moral i discern i've no fear but that your grace will see it clear for you tis only simple play but for my muse in any way twould toil in fact i'll not the truth let fall for you who need it not at all fable two hundred and eighteen the miser and the ape a man was a miser every one knows that his was a vice which grows and grows this was a man that filled jars and buckets old stockings and coffers with pistols and ducats tis a maxim of mine that such things left unused i mean pistols and ducats are simply abused to secure all his wealth from the lovers of stealth my miser had built him a home surrounded by waves with their foam and there with a pleasure the which to some seems but poor to some rich he heaped up his wealth with delight and every day and each night he counted the sum and recounted and gloated to see how it mounted but somehow count well as he might the gold pieces never came right and the source of this grievous disaster was this that an ape than his master more wise to my mind took a pleasure 
in flinging to seaward his treasure the miser secure with his double locked door was wont to leave silver and gold all loose on his table untold ah ah said the monkey one day i'll fling this in the sea twill be gay now for me it were hard to decide if the master or ape were the wiser twould be half for the ape half for the miser well as i've said the ape one day laying hands on master's gold many a ducat flung away with sovereigns new and angels old with huge delight he tried his skill and ducks and drakes made with a will of golden coins which mortals seem to think of mortal goods the cream in fact had not the monkey heard the key within the keyhole stirred and feared its master every coin had gone its comrades to rejoin and neath the waves with golden flecks had lit the gloomy floor of wrecks now blessings on each miser's head both whilst he lives and when he's dead end of fable 218 this recording is in the public domain fables 219 and 220 by jean de la fontaine translated by walter thornbury read for librivox.org by sonia to the duke of burgundy in answer to a request for a fable on the cat and the mouse to please the youthful prince whom courtly fame destines and templed in my works to be how shall i write a fable with this name le chat et la souris how can i represent in verse a maid who sweet in aspect yet still ruthless played with hearts her charms snared as you see le petit chat does la souris shall i sketch fortune and show her deceit tell how she gulls the world with the old cheat treating poor self-complacent friends you see comme le chat does la souris shall i depict of all earth royalty the only one her restless wheel that stays the one who wars with europe's chivalry and with the strongest of his foemen plays comme le chat with la souris but as i write there comes insensibly the plan that suits me if i don't mistake i should spoil all if lazy i should be mockery the prince of my poor muse would make comme le chat of la souris fable two hundred and nineteen the old cat and the young mouse a young mouse small and innocent implored an old cat's clemency ramina grobis let me live your royal mercy monarch give a mouse so little sir as i a tiny meal can well supply how could i starve a family host hostess only look at me i fatten on a grain of wheat a mite my dinner makes complete i'm thin too now just wait a bit and for your children i'll be fit thus to the cat the mouse aggrieved the other answered you're deceived is it to me you talk like that go tell the deaf and dumb not me old cats don't pardon so you'll see the law condemns and you must die descend and tell the fates that i have stopped your preaching and be sure my children's meals will not be fewer he kept his word and to my fable i add a moral as i'm able youth hopes to win all by address but age is ever pitiless fable two hundred and twenty the bat the bush and the duck a bat a bush and duck one day finding home business would not pay resolved their purses to unite and risks of foreign trade invite soon with factors counters agents and all the merchants usual pageants ledgers day-books and all that surrounded they grew rich and fat all went on well till lucklessly a cargo trusted to the sea and traversing a rock-bound strait ill piloted endured the fate of all the other treasures which king neptune's sea-roofed vaults enrich great cries of grief the trio uttered that is to say they only muttered for every little merchant knows that credit loves no trader's woes but spite of every cautious plan 
the tail through all the city ran and now duck bush and bat were seen ready to wear the bonnet green without or credit or resources for none would ope for them their purses all sorts of creditors daily arrived with bailiffs and writs and the door scarce survived the continual thrum of their creditors glum and of course the bush bat and the duck were intent to find means this importunate crowd to contend the bush with his thorns caught the man that went by and said with a sort of a pitiful cry pray sirs can you tell in what part of the sea the wealth of myself and my partners may be whilst that diver the duck plunging down out of sight went to find them he said if he possibly might but the bat followed daily by bailiffs and duns at noon all the haunts of the human race shuns and stricken with shame to keep quite out of sight hides in ruins all day and flies only by night many a debtor have i known neither bush nor bat nor duck who even had not such ill luck as was upon this trio thrown but simple lords who shunning snares sneaked always down by the back stairs End of Fable 220. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 221 and 222 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Fable 221 The Eagle and the Magpie. The Eagle queen of the broad sky met one day in a field the pie in mind and language different in plumage and in every bent chance brought them into a byway the magpie was afraid to stay the eagle having dined but lately assured her calmly and sedately come let's be social said the eagle then and if the lord of gods and men sometimes is weary of the king who rules the universe the thing is clear that enway may e'en vex one who serves jove amuse me come and chatter as you do at home it is not me you will perplex the pie began at once to gabble on this and that on lords and rabble just like the man in horace just good bad indifferent all on trust talking incessant and still worse than the poor old fool in the famed verse she offers if it pleases his grace to skip about and watch each place he wishes jove knows that the pie was well constructed for a spy the eagle answers angrily don't leave your home my tattling friend adieu i have no wish to send a gossip to corrupt my court and spread each lying false report i hate a gossip quite content maggie cared little where she went to dwell among the gods or kings is not the pleasantest of things that honour has its pangs also detractors spies and many a foe gracious and bland enough in face but false in heart infest each place and make you odious in courts wear coats of two colours or take care fable two hundred twenty two the quarrel of the dogs and the cats and also that of the cats and the mice discord has always ruled this universe our world of this could many facts rehearse this goddess over countless subjects reigns the elements not jupiter himself restrains nor these four potentates alone wage war in many races there's a ceaseless jar a house once full of dogs and cats grew free of strife at last by many a grave decree the master fixed their hours in every meal and let the quarrelsome his horsewhip feel they live at last like cousins almost brothers and furnish quite examples to all others at length peace ended some stray tempting bone some broth or little preference to one shown made both belligerent half crazy run to plead the grievous injury that's done i've heard that learned writers of old law attribute this to some small legal flaw be what it might they both made angry claims and set the kitchen and the hall in flames 
some loud for dog and some for cat cried out the cats went mewing the dogs whined about they deafened everyone cat's advocate referred to the decree and the debate ceased at that word but still they searched in vain where it was hid and sought and sought again the mice had eaten it then lo once more the mice were sufferers many many a score the old cat swallowed some with cruel claws expounded to the mice their coat of laws laid ambuscades caught them in many ways and from their master obtained food and praise Mayanomutan, not beneath the skies lives there a creature without enemies tis nature's law and how is purblind man the secret of god's mysteries to scan it is god's will further i do not go we waste our time in trying but to know man is at sixty years a wandering fool fit to be whipped and sent again to school end of fable two hundred and twenty two this recording is in the public domain Fables 223 and 224 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org, by Roger Matheson, Exeter, England, April 2017. Fable 223. Love and Folly. All is mysterious with love, his bow and arrow, torch and wings. Tis not a day's work in a grove to master these momentous things explain them my poor muse cannot my object is but in my way to tell of cupid's wretched lot and how he lost the light of day whether that fate be ill or well for those whom cupid since has met lovers alone can rightly tell i cannot though i felt his net folly and love together played one day before he lost his sight but yet as people will they strayed from friendship and got stung by spite disputes are really melancholy love wanted all the gods and men as umpires but impatient folly preferred it settled there and then and gave poor cupid such a blow that both his pretty eyes were seared for blessed sight gave blindness lo their heaven's blue brightness disappeared his mother venus heard his grief and cried for vengeance like one mad on jove and nemesis in brief on gods of all kinds good and bad the case she said was very strong her blind son would require a stick and dog to help him walk along alas for cruel folly's trick the gods poor cupid's case discussed and boys and girls in love decide decreeing that it's only just folly should love in future guide fable two hundred and twenty four the wolf and the fox how comes this general discontent here is a man for lack of wit longing to live beneath the tent the soldiers longing so to quit a certain fox aspired to be a wolf and who's prepared to say the wolf may not think luxury consists in the lamb's peaceful play it much surprises me to find a poet prince but eight years old who writes prose of a better kind than i can verse ay twentyfold though long experience makes me bold the thoughts throughout his fable spread are not a poet's work i know they're numerous and better said unto a prince the praise we owe i play upon a simple pipe that is my talent just to please but soon my hero growing ripe the clarion will make me seize i am no prophet yet i read the starry signs that promise give his glorious acts will homer need homer alas he does not live the fox said to the wolf one day my dear i have but old tough hens for my poor cheer one wearies of the food but you feed well and with less hazard i where people dwell slink round while you keep prudently away teach me your trade my noble comrade pray and make me the first of all my race who slew a good fat sheep and took him for a stew 
i shall not be ungrateful the wolf said tis well i have a brother newly dead put on his skin fox took it and obeyed the wolf then bid him not to be afraid of all the mastiffs of the shepherd's flock the fox learnt of his maxims the whole stock first blundered much then studied all he could and lastly well the precepts understood just as he finished there came passing by a drove of sheep he runs at them they fly the new-made wolf spreads terror everywhere and frightened bleatings fill the troubled air so in achilles arms patroclus came mothers and old men shudder at his name the sheep see fifty wolves and in full cry dogs sheep and shepherds to the village fly one only as a hostage left behind is by the villain seized upon the wind just then came crow of lusty chanticleer the pupil snapped the fowl and without fear threw by his school dress all his task forgot and ran off heedless of his future lot how useless was this counterfeiting then the changed suit hindered not the watchful men they follow in his track the selfsame day and when they find him they are quick to slay from your unequal mind my poor muse drew the story and its moral plain but true end of fable 224 this recording is in the public domain. Fables 225 and 226 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Roger Mathewson Exeter, England Fable 225 the crab and its daughter sages are often like the crabs inclined to backward step and leave their goal behind this is the sailor's art and now and then the artifice of deep designing men who feign the opposite of their intent to put their adversaries off the scent my subject is a trifle but how wide the field on which its morals may be tried some general may conquer should he heed it an army with a hundred chiefs to lead it his plans of march and countermarch may be at first a secret then a victory no use in prying when he would conceal from fate's decrees one cannot make appeal the tide grows insurmountable at length against a jove the gods may waste their strength louis and fate seem partners now in glory and draw the world along but to my story said mother crab to her daughter crab one day how can you step in such an ugly way do try to go a little straighter dear the little crab made answer with a sneer look at yourself it's very well to talk but it was you who taught me how to walk from you and from your friends i took my gait if they go crooked how can i go straight she told the truth for lessons that we learn from family examples last the longest they teach us good and evil in its turn and off the latter lessons are the strongest as to the way of walking let me add that turning backs has often merit in it in war for instance it is far from bad if people do it at the proper minute fable two hundred and twenty six the forest and the woodman a woodman with too strong a stroke the handle of his brave axe broke broke it beyond repair for though he ranged the forest side of proper trees both far and wide the scanty wood seemed bare then to the sylvan gods he prayed that they his steps would sweetly guide unto the spot where they had made that branch for which he sighed to gain his bread himself he take far far away and for their sake would spare both fir and oak respected are their charms and age and graceful in the poet's sage twas thus the woodman spoke the innocent forest gave the bow 
the woodman hacked both oak and fir the groaning forest soon found how her gift brought death to her behold the way the world doth spin some men say politicians win a place then bite their friend of them i tire but should dear trees bear such rude outrages as these and i not mourn their end in vain i sing it is no use although my dart stings where it is hurled ingratitude and gross abuse are no less in the world end of fable 226 this recording is in the public domain Fables number 227 and 228 by Jean de la Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Anthony Castellani. Fable 227. The Fox, the Flies, and the Hedgehog. Wounded and weak and dripping fast with blood, a fox crept wearily through mire and mud. Quickly attracted by the hopeful sight, a fly, a restless winged parasite, came to show sympathy and bite. The fox accused the gods on high, thought fate had vexed him cruelly. Why attack me? Am I a treat? When were the foxes thought good meat? I the most nimble, clever beast. Am I to be for flies a feast? Now heaven confound the paltry thing, so small, yet with so sharp a sting. A hedgehog hearing all his curses, his first appearance in my verses, Wish to set the poor beast free of the fly's importunity. My neighbor said the worthy soul, I'll use my darts and slay the whole. For heaven's sake, poor Reynard says, don't do it, let them go their ways. These animals are full, you see, new ones will bite more greedily. Such torments in this land are seen, courtiers and magistrates, I mean. Great Aristotle likens flies to certain men, and he was wise. But when such folk get full of gold, they're less importunate, I'm told. Fable 228 The Hawk, the King, and the Falcon To Monsignor the Prince de Conti As the gods are forgiving, they wish that the lords, whom they send to rule over us creatures below, should control the proud use of their conquering swords, and to subjects the mercies of charity show. O oh, prince, tis well known that you think in this way, that you conquer your foes, but still pause ere you slay. And in this, for your one who no passions subdue, Achilles, as hero, was far beneath you. This title of hero, in fact, should belong, but to those who do good, this was always the case. In the ages of gold, but now absence from wrong, with a grave character gives men the place. So far are you, prince, from deserving this stain, that for half your good actions you merit a fane. Apollo the poet, who dwells in the skies, sings already the praise of your name, tis believed. Fast in heaven the walls of your mansion arise, for of glory enough on the earth you've received. May the sweetest of charms that God Hymen can give, for you and the princess eternally live, for you fully deserve it in token of this. I will point to your gifts, both of riches and bliss to those qualities wondrous which, owned but by few, to grace your young years Jove has lavished on you, your spirit, O prince, with such grace has combined, that which most to prize a sweet puzzle we find. For sometimes esteem takes our homage by force, and then love leaps in with impetuous course. But to sing all your praises and merits were long, so changing my key in a far humbler song, I'll tell you a tale how a fierce bird of prey assaulted a king and got safely away tis seldom falconers contrive to take a new-fledged hawk alive but one so taken to a king was made a humble offering the bird if true the story be no sooner saw his majesty than straight the royal nose he clawed and then the royal forehead gnawed what clutch a mighty monarch's nose he wore no crown then i suppose had he wore crown and scepter too T'were all the same, the creature flew, and king's nose clawed like common nose. Of course an uproar loud arose, such as my verse could scarce describe, from all the startled courtier tribe. The king alone was calm and cool, 
for calmness is with kings a rule. The bird kept his place and could not be persuaded to vacate the strange throne he'd so roughly invaded. His master, in vain, with threats and with cries, showed him his fist, but he would not arise. And it seemed at length as though the bird, insolent creature, would cling to that feature. Until the next morning's chimes were heard. The greater the efforts to make him let go, the deeper he dug in each keen-pointed toe. At length he relaxed, of his own fickle will. Then the king said to those round about, Do not kill, the poor bird nor the falcon are trouble, for each, in his several way, has obeyed nature's teaching. The one has just proved himself falcon or good, and the other a real savage thing of the wood. And I, knowing well that kings clement should be, grant both full pardon, so let them go free. Of course the courtiers all declared that such great mercy ne'er was shown, and had the trouble been their own, nor man nor bird would have been spared. Few kings indeed had acted so, and let the woodmen freely go. They escaped right well, but boar and bird, and nothing in this matter erred. But only this, that woodland bred, they had not learnt enough to dread. The neighbors of courts, but this small lapse, may be excused in such poor folk, perhaps. The following story, Pilpe places, where Ganges nourishes dusk races, where a man ne'er dares to spill the blood of any living thing for food. For how can we tell, they say, that this creature was not present at the siege of Troy, a hero then, and that he'll not be so again? For we Pythagoreans are, and think that different forms we bear, at different seasons pigeon now, and then a hawk, and next a cow. At present we are men, and so, through every change of form we go. The tale of that bold bird who clutched the king is told two ways, the second now I'll sing. A woodman that, by luck or wit, a hawk had seized, went off with it, to lay it at his monarch's feet, such captures we but seldom meet, once in a hundred years indeed, tis written in the falconer's creed, that woodman who a hawk can catch in nest is any woodman's match. Through all the crowd of courtiers then, our huntsman, happiest of men, Thrust with his prize at last secure, his fortune now was firm and sure. But just as he had reached the throne, seized with a rage before unknown, the savage bird, untamed as yet, in spite of chained foot, turned and set, his claws deep in his master's nose. All laughed, as you may well suppose, the courtiers and the monarch too, such very comic sight to view. I'd give a crown, though it were new. If popes may laugh, I'm not quite sure. But kings could not their lives endure, if they might laugh not, tis divine. And Jove, though mostly Saturnine, with all his comrades, laughs at times, enough to shake these earthly climes. And Jove laughed loudest when, I think, poor hobbling Vulcan gave him drink. Whether or no, tis well arranged, that gods should laugh, my subjects changed. With reason for tis time to ask, what moral lies beneath the mask of falconer unfortunate? This simple lesson I will state. To every land each cycle brings more foolish woodmen than good kings. End of Fable 228. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 229 and 230 by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornberry and read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Fable 229, The Fox and the Turkeys Against a fox a tree served well, the turkeys for a citadel. The cunning rascal made the round, and sentries at each opening found. What, these fools mock me then, he cried, and at the common lot deride? Forbid it, gods, forbid it, pride! And this vow of his chivalry he soon performed, as you will see. The moon came just then shining out, as if the turkeys foes to rout. But he no novice in assault, like this was not, of course, at fault. And from his bag of schemes so sly, drew one to trap the weak and shy. He feigns to climb with rampant paws, and next apes death with close-fixed jaws. He then revives resuscitated, no harlequin so much elated, 
raises his tail and makes it shine, and in the moonlight glitter fine. No single turkey dares to sleep, but ceaseless tiring watch they keep. Worn out they try their eyes to fix upon their foeman's wicked tricks. At last half giddy one by one fall headlong and his game is done. He puts them carefully aside till nearly half of them have died. Then the bold rascal quickly bore away the heap to fill his store. If dangers we too closely heed, tis ten to one they come indeed. End of Fable 229 Fable 230 The Crow, the Gazelle, the Tortoise, and the Rat To Madame de la Sablière I, by means of verse, would raise A temple to your lasting praise. Already its foundations lie Based on that art which comes from high, And on the name of her whose fame Adoring clouds shall there proclaim. I'd write above its portal stones, This fane the goddess Iris owns, But not the Iris who for Juno Goes out with messages, as you know. A different Iris, whom the lord of gods and Juno too were glad To serve if they her summons had, When she such honour would accord. The apotheosis placed on high Should show the people of the sky, My iris to a throne conducting, A throne of sunlight's soul constructing. In frescoes on the panels placed Should all her life's sweet tale be traced, A charming story and one far, Remote from all the tales of war. Deep in the temple's chief recess A painting should in part express, her form, her features, her bright smiles, and all the thousand artless wiles by which she gods and men beguiles. Lo, at her feet should there be shown all the great men the world may own, great demigods besides, and even the natural habitants of heaven. For certain tis that they to whom men pray to iris burn perfume, the artist's care should chiefly be to make her eyes her soul express. But ah, to paint her tenderness, T'were all in vain to try, may be, No art upon the earth resides, For which a task like this provides, To paint a soul in which combine Man's strength with graces feminine. O oh, Iris, you who charm us all, Before whose heavenly grace we fall, You whom before ourselves we prize, But mind I am not making love, For love's a word you don't approve. Yet even from this rough sketch may a better likeness rise some day. The project of your sacred building I've just for artist's purpose filled in. The foreground of a story which is so with rare found friendship rich, that haply it may favor find with one that is so good and kind. Of friendship monarchs seldom dream, but he who gains your heart's esteem is not a king devoid of love, no, he your gentle thoughts approve, is a brave mortal who would give his life that some dear friend might live. A rat, a gazelle, and a tortoise and crow live together as friends in a desolate place, and as they took care to indulge in no show, man failed for some time the companions to trace. But alas, for poor beasts, there's no safety from man. Whatever concealment their instincts may plan, To the heart of the desert, the depths of the sea, Or to heaven's own vault, tis in vain that they flee. The gazelle one sad day was at innocent play, When a dog, cruel dogs, whom the men treat as brothers, Though beasts to assist them to capture the others, Unluckily snuffed at her scent and pursuing, Led on his fierce master to cause her undoing. When dinner came that day, the rat said, What can Miss Gazelle be at? She surely dreads some new attacks, Or else our friendship's bonds relax. Ah, then the tortoise sighing cried, If heaven wings would but provide, Such as our crow has, I would fly, And all around the country spy, To find what accidents withhold Our friend, her heart's as good as gold. The crow without a word took flight, and soon had poor gazelle in sight, tied up with cords against a tree, a hapless piece of misery. 
at once the crow without a pause flies back nor seeks to probe the cause the whys the wherefores or the when which makes gazelles the prey of men nor loses time for action meant in a pedantic argument the crow's report was duly heard and then the crow a vote preferred that two should speed without delay to where their friend in bondage lay but that the tortoise lying still should serve the counter guard the till for whilst the tortoise step is slow gazelles die quickly as we know the words were scarcely said when forth the angry crow and rat went north to where their dark-eyed dear gazelle lay victim of man's purpose fell the tortoise also not behind hand to lend to any one a kind hand toiled thither also grimly swearing that he his house must still be bearing arrived at the place where the deer was confined sir nonnet the rat is so properly named at once set his teeth the hard cordage to grind and in less than two minutes the friend was reclaimed the hunter coming up just then cursed like a thousand sporting men and master rat with prudence fraught a cosy hole directly sought whilst crow swam safely up to tree and dear gazelle in woods ran free just then the hunter in a state of hunger most disconsolate perceived the tortoise on his path and thereupon subdued his wrath why should i said he vex myself this beast will grace my supper shelf and thus the hapless tortoise soon had been condemned to knife and spoon had not the crow the dear gazelle taught how to act the lame man well the timid deer with halting feet went forth the hunter's eyes to meet the man threw off without delay all that his eager steps might stay the tortoise with some other things of course the rat undid the strings that held the bag where tortoise lay and all four friends got safe away tis pilpe that has told this tale and if upon the god of song i chose to call i might prolong this quadrupedal history and write another odyssey and if to please you i should take this work upon me i should make the rat the hero yet tis true that each had work and did it too the tortoise though with mansion waited the case in point so clearly stated that master crow at once took wing to spy the land and message bring whilst dear gazelle with female cunning before the hunter lamely running gave to sir gnaw cord time to bite the strings which held the tortoise tight so each one in his several way fought a good fight and won the day on whom shall we the prize bestow on the good heart as you'll allow what will not friendship dare for those on whom its gentle tendrils close that other feeling love is not compared with friendship worth a jot although to tell the truth its pains distract my heart and fill my strains it is love's gentle sister you protect and i'll adore her too and blending friendship with your name throughout the world her joys proclaim End of Fable 230 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 231 and 232 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Fable 231 The English Fox To Madame Harvey a good heart is in you with sense allied and scores of other qualities well tried a nobleness of soul and mind to guide both men and things a temper frank and free and friendship firm though tempest there may be all this deserves we know a pompous praise but pomp displeases you so i'll not raise my voice but simple be and brief I would insert a word of flattery, if I could, about the country that you love so dear. The English are profound, in this their mind follows their temperament, as oft we find. Deep, deep they dig for truth, and without end the empire of the sciences extend. 
I write not this to win goodwill from you. Your nation are deep searchers, it is true. Even your dogs, they say, have keener scent than ours. Your foxes are of craftier mental powers. I'll prove it by an artful stratagem, the most ingenious ever planned by them. A wicked Reynard, chased quite out of breath by the untiring dogs, and dreading death, saw a tall gallows where dead badgers hung, and owls and foxes were together strung. Cruel examples for the passerby. Reynard, in ambuscade, prepared to lie, like Hannibal who, when the Romans chased, baffled their armies and their spies disgraced. Old fox this was. His enemies soon ran to where he lay for dead. The barking clan filled all the air with clamor, long and loud. The master whipped away the noisy crowd. The trick deceived him. Come, you dogs, he cried. Some puppies saved the rascal, who ne'er tried to climb the gibbet, where such honest folk repose. Some day he'll find the gallows a rough joke, much to his loss, and while the dogs give tongue, back to his larder goes the fox just hung. Another day he'll try the self-same plan, and leave his brush and four paws with the man. Tricks won't do twice. The hunter ne'er had thought of such a scheme, had he been nearly caught, not from the want of wit at all, you see. For who can say the English want a spree? But their contempt for life has often led to evil in such dangers, it is said. And now I once more turn to you, not for more flattery, tis true. All long eulogium does but tire, I, a poor player on the lyre. With flattering songs and little verse, amuse the mighty universe, or win a distant nation's praise. Your prince once said in former days, he valued very far above all studied praise one word of love. Accept the humble gift I bring, last efforts that I mean to sing. But poor indeed, and all unformed yet were there by new fervor warmed. Could you but make this homage known to her, who fills your country's zone with sprites from Cytherea's isle? I speak, you know it by your smile, of Mazarin, Jove dear to thee, and Cupid's sovereign deity. Fable 232 The Ape There was a certain ape in Paris. Like many other ape, he marries. He chose a wife, and then, like some bad husbands, beat her deaf and dumb, aping their ways. Poor soul sighed, and, after that, at last she died. Their infant cries, but cries in vain, and sorrows o'er and o'er again. The father laughs, his wife is dead, and he has other loves instead, whom he will also beat, I trow. He's often drunk, that well I know. From one who's aping others look for nothing good, whether a book he makes or work performs. Yes, all, upon whichever one you fall, are bad. The author aped the worst, and of all monkey creatures first. End of Fable 232 This recording is in the public domain. Fables 233 and 234 by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by Walter Thornbury Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo Fable 233 The Fox, the Wolf, and the Horse A fox, still young, though rather sly, saw, first time in his life, a horse. Just then a stupid wolf passed by, and Reynard saw a game, of course. Come, see this thing that's feeding near. He's grand. I view him with delight. Is he more strong than us, my dear? Think you with both of us he'd fight? Replied the wolf with laughter. Now draw me his portrait. Then I'll tell. The fox said, Could I write or show on canvas all his beauties well? Your pleasure would be great indeed, but come. What say you? 
He may be some easy prey on whom we'll feed, by fortune sent to you and me. The horse, still feeding on the plain, scarce curious to see the pair, planned flying with his might and main, for wolves have tricks that are unfair. The sly fox said, Your servant, sir, we wish to know your name. The horse had brains, so said, My shoemaker has put it round my shoe, of course. Read, if you can, there is my name. The fox had store of craft and need, he cried, My parents were to blame. They taught me not to write or read. Tis only muddy wolves who learn to read. They read things in a breath. Our flattered wolf here made a turn, but vanity cost him his teeth. The clever horse, as he drew near, held high his hoof. His plan he saw, it cost the reading wolf most dear. Down came the hoof upon his jaw. With broken bones and bloody coat, Upon the ground the poor wolf lay. Brother, the fox said, only note, The truth that we've heard people say. With wisdom, what had been your case? No pain would need to be discussed. This horse has stamped upon your face. That, unknown things, wise men mistrust. Fable 234 The League of the Rats A mouse in very deadly fear of an old cat that kept too near a certain passage being wise and shrewd went straight without disguise to ask a neighbor rat whose house was close to that of mr mouse the rat's domains so fair and snug were under a large mansion dug this rat a hundred times had sworn he feared no cat that yet was born both tooth and paw he held in scorn. Dame Mouse, the lying boaster cried, May foi, how can I, ma'am, decide alone? I cannot chase the cat, but call and gather every rat that's living near. I have a trick, in fact, at nothing. I will stick. The mouse, she curtsied humbly then, the rat ran off to call his men. Unto the office, pantry named, where many rats, not to be blamed, were feasting at their host's expense, with very great magnificence. He enters troubled, out of breath. What have you done? Your pail is death, says one. Pray speak. Says he, alas, friend Mouse is in a pretty pass, and needs immediate help from you. Romina Groby, in my view, spreads dreadful carnage everywhere. This cat, this hideous, monstrous cat, if mice are wanting, calls for rat. They all cry out, "'Tis true, two arms, and some, they say, mid-war's alarms. Shed tears, but no one stops behind. They all are of the self-same mind. They pack up cheese and scrip and bag. No single nibbler dares to lag. With mind content and spirit gay, it is to them a holiday. The cat, meanwhile, quite free from dread, has gripped the mouse by its wee head. A charging pace the rats at last come, but the cat still holds it fast, and growling faces the whole band. At this grim sound the rats offhand with prudence make a swift retreat, fearing their destiny to meet. Each hurries to his humble hole, nor seeks again the warrior's goal. End of Fable 234. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 235 and 236 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. A Scythian Philosopher A philosopher once, who in Scythia born, had somewhat with study his brain pan outworn, made his mind up for pleasure and profit to seek repose for a time in the land of the Greek, and there he made friends with a man of the kind whom Virgil so well in the Georgics defined, a man who's a king, for himself he controls, and a god, for he blends his own will with men's souls. 
he found him with pruning knife grasped in his hand pruning here snipping there in all parts of his land as tranquil as jove here he cut off a twig there lopped off a branch to make others more big for nature experience had taught him is prone to waste in rash gifts all the wealth of her throne the scythian brought up in town was downcast and looked at the ruinous waste quite aghast and exclaimed my dear friend lay your pruning hook down and let nature judicious take care of her own for at best you are taking much pains to deflower the fruits which time's tooth will but too soon devour the old man replied with a rustical grace i cut useless ones off to give useful ones space struck by wisdom like this with no moment's delay the scythian homewards at once took his way and no sooner had got there but took up a bill and cutting and hewing showed wonderful skill hewed branches snipped twigs and persuaded his neighbors to share in his rude horticultural labors the result is soon told hacking trees without reason in summer or spring taking no thought of season must lead to results which no words can belie for the trees thus instructed instinctively die now the scythian stands for a symbol of those who wish all the pathways of pleasure to close hoot hoot at ambition forbid a new dress and from lexicons banish the sweet word caress for myself though by custom not given to swearing i'll say that by jove such old dolts there's no bearing they wish us to choke whilst we've plenty of breath and whilst full of life's vigour to simulate death daphnis and alcimadura an imitation of theocritus to madame de la messanger amiable daughter of a mother fair for whom a thousand hearts are torn with care yours are the hearts whom friendship holds in fee and those that love keeps firm in fealty this preface i divide tween her and you the brightest essence of parnassus dew i have the secret to perfume for you more exquisitely sweet i'll tell thee then but i must choose or i shall fail again my lyre and voice will need more power and skill let me then praise alone a heart that's still full of all noble sentiments the grace the mind which need no master but the one we find blooming above you guard those roses well and do not let the thorns o'ergrow ma belle love will the same thing say and better too those who neglect him cupid makes to rue as you shall see alcimadur the fair despised the god who rules the earth and air fierce and defiant she roamed through the wood ran o'er the meadows danced as none else could obeyed caprice alone of beauty queen most cruel of the cruel she had been for long beloved by daphnis of good race was the poor lad who doted on her face loved for her very scorn nay more i vow than had she loved him with an equal glow yet not a look she gave nor word to cheer nor his complaints would ever even hear weary of the pursuit prepared to die down at her door despair had made him lie alack he wooed the winds she blithe and gay still kept her door shut twas her natal day and to her beauty's throne she spread fair flowers the treasures of the garden and spring hours i hoped before your very eyes he cried had i not been so hateful to have died how can i wonder that you do deny this last sad pleasure of fidelity my father i have charged my heritage to offer at your feet the pasturage and all my flocks my dog of dogs the best and my companions will then with the rest found a small temple where continually your image crowned with flowers shall ever be my simple monument shall be near it and this inscription on the stone i've writ of love poor daphnis died stop passer-by weep and say he was slain by cruelty of fair alcimadura the fates at last cut the thin thread and his vexed spirit passed the cruel maiden came forth proud and gay 
in vain her friends beseech her but to stay a moment on the course to shed one tear she still insulted cupid without fear bringing that very evening o'er the plain to dance around the statue all her train the image fell and crushed her with its weight then from the cloud thus spoke the voice of fate love and delay not the hard heart is dead the shade of daphnis raised its pallid head and on the banks of Styx stood shuddering while all vast erebus with wondering heard to the shepherd the fair homicide excuse her cruelty and foolish pride but as to phantom ajax ulysses sued and dido's death the guilty lover rude so from the maiden shadow turned the swain and did not words of mercy to her deign end of fable 236「Fables 237 and 238 by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by Walter Thornbury, read for LibriVox.org by Roger Mathewson, Exeter, England, February 2017. Fable 237 The Elephant and Jupiter's Monkey An elephant had words one day with a rhinoceros, they say. They settled they would fight it out. But while the matter was about, Jove's monkey, like a mercury, came. Giles was, historians say, his name. The elephant, a brute ambitious, was pleased to find the heavens propitious. Eager for fame, he smiled to see so dignified an embassy. But Giles, though wise in all essentials, is slow presenting his credentials. At length he comes to pay respect yet still shows somewhat of neglect speaks not a word no single mention of the great deity's attention what care those living in the skies if perish elephants or flies the potentate's compelled to speak my cousin jupiter this week will see from his olympic throne a pretty combat as he'll own and his court too will see it partly what combat said the monkey tartly pooh said the elephant you know about the rhinoceros and the blow tis property that we dispute in a long tedious chancery suit elephantor and rhinocer are warring as you've heard up there i'm pleased to learn their names good sir said master giles but king you err if you think we of such things heed the elephant surprised indeed said who then come you now to aid i come to part a blade of grass between some ants to every class our cares of sovereignty extend as for your wars my noble friend the gods have not heard of them yet or if they have they do forget the small and great are in jove's eye guarded with like equality fable two hundred and thirty eight the madman and the philosopher a certain madman as the story goes threw stones at a philosopher one day the latter said my friend i don't suppose you care to work so hard without your pay here take this crown how deeply i regret i cannot better recompense your trouble go pelt yon gentleman and you may get a larger sum perhaps as much as double pleased at the chance our fool begins to throw big stones at a patrician but instead of giving gold the lackeys mauled him so that they departed leaving him half dead such fools there are in kingly courts who raise the laugh at your expense but can you check their silly sports or stop their loud impertinence if any words or any blows of yours are powerless to hush them just get them to be rude to those who have sufficient force to crush them. End of Fable 238. This recording is in the public domain. Fables 239 and 240 by Jean de La Fontaine. 
Translated by Walter Thunbury. Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Frogs and the Sun The daughters of the mud obtained help from the star king while he reigned. No war nor any like disaster could harm them under such a master. His empire was the most serene. The pond queens, frogs I really mean, for why not give their honorable name, against their benefactors plotted shame, imprudence, pride, and base ingratitude, good fortune's children roused the restless brood. They could not sleep a wink to trust their cry. They would have stirred the world to mutiny. Against the eye of nature, the great sun. It had begun to burn them. He must run to arms and gather all his powerful band, or he'd be driven from his own fair land. The croaking embassies would go through all the regions to and fro to make the whole world hear their case and gather pity from each place. All the world seemed bent on this that for marshes took amiss. Still this rash complaint went on, still this grumbling at the sun. Yet in vain the noise and riot, frogs must, after all, be quiet, for if the sun is once inflamed, they will very soon be tamed, and the frog republic will find they've calculated ill. The Arbitrator, Almaner, and Hermit Three saints, by holy fervor fired, to gain the heights of heaven aspired, but as the well-known proverb says, Rome can be reached by various ways. So these by different methods planned to gain the shores of Canaan's land. One touched by the expense and care, which luckless suitors have to bear, offered cases to determine, without a fee or wig or ermine. Since human laws were first began, lawsuits have been the curse of man, absorbing half, three-fourths, or all of days which at the best are small. To cure a state of things so vicious, our umpire thought his plan judicious. The second of our saints declares the sick sole object of his cares, and I praise him, in truth to me this seems the truest charity. But sick men, troublous then as now, our good man vexed enough, I vow, capricious, restless, petulant, each moment brings a separate want. And if no other fault they find, they cry, To such and such his kind, Spends all his days and nights in caring for them, And leaves us here despairing. But these complaints were small to those Which harassed every day the heart Of him who well-intentioned chose To act the arbitrator's part. The plaintiff and defendant both, to adopt his sentences were loath, and swore with all their might and main his partiality was plain. By such abuse as this disgusted the umpire and the almoner, each unto each his woes entrusted, and each agreed he could not bear to be so shamefully mistrusted. This being so, they sought a glade which neither suns nor winds invade, and there, beneath a rugged mountain, beside a clear and babbling fountain, they found their friend the hermit saint, 
So each one, having made his plaint, asked his advice. Your own pursue, replied their friend, for who but you can know your several wants? To know one's self make gods of men below. And let me ask you, have you found this knowledge where vast crowds abound? No, trust me, it can only be the fruit of sweet tranquillity. Shake but the water in your vase, and you no longer see your face. But let it once more still remain, and straight your likeness comes again. Midst worldly scenes, you'll never learn the love for which we all should yearn. Believe me, friends, the desert's best for him who'd study his own breast. To each the hermit's words seemed good, and henceforth each one sought the wood. Of course, there's always work to do, whilst men still sicken and still sue, for lawyers and for doctors, and they'll never perish from the land, thank mighty Jove, as long as fees and honours greet their services. But in such common toils the mind can seldom its true likeness find. O oh, you who give your lives away and serve the public every day, you princes, judges, magistrates, exposed to all the angry fates, who, when no other ill oppressors are slain by Judas-like caresses, to you yourselves are all unknown, and if some moment is your own, for self-reflection ere it flies, tis spoilt by hateful flattery's lies. This lesson shall conclude these pages. May it be blessed to future ages. To kings I give it, to the wise commend. How could my volume better end? End of Fable 240. This recording is in the public domain. End of the Fables of La Fontaine by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by Walter Thornbury.